Hi, my name is Hugo, and this is the ninth episode of All Under Heaven. This is the second of two episodes on Wu Di, and if you haven't listened to the first one, I would recommend listening to that first. There's a it provides kind of a main context for his reign, the military campaigns that you have to be aware of. But uh, but you know, as Dan Carlin says, some people like listening to stuff out of order, so whatever suits you. Last episode, we talked about Han expansionism under Wu Di, and it was the longest episode since the ones on the Qin. However, Wu Di's reign was so important and changed so many things in China that we're only halfway done talking about it. We've told the story of the conquest of new lands and the major victory over the Xiongnu, which was a turning point in Han dynasty history. Now we'll be looking at what was going on within China. What effects did this intense period of warfare and expansion have on other aspects of Chinese life? And we'll also get to shed a bit of light on who exactly Wu Di was as a person, and what impact his particular characteristics had on Chinese history. Aside from the foreign conquests, Wu Di's reign is known for two important developments. Firstly, for the emergence and confirmation of Confucianism as the state ideology, which went together with a sort of cultural flourishing and confidence. And secondly, for a quite pragmatic and even totalitarian approach to policy and law, an approach that was more often associated with legalism and the Qin. These two developments interacted and contradicted with each other in interesting ways, and I'll try to refer, and I'll try to refer back to them as the two themes of this episode. The first thing I'd like to talk about is the rise of Confucianism, which was perhaps the most important event of Wu Di's reign. With a few exceptional periods, Confucianism in one form or another was the state ideology of imperial China right until 1911 and that began with Wu Di. I made a supplementary episode which covers in a bit more detail the state of Confucianism from the beginning of the Han Dynasty to the start of Wu Di's reign, so check that out if you'd like to know more. To summarise, while some Confucians had made important contributions to the Han as a dynasty, notably Xu Sun Tong, who drew up the court rituals for Gao Zhu, Confucianism as a school of thought was just one among many, and by no means the most favoured by the court. In fact, Grand Empress Dowager Dor, wife of Wen Di, mother of Jing Di, grandmother of Wu Di, was a devotee of Huang Laoism and quite opposed to Confucians. At the accession of Wu Di, the emperor was still a teenager and Empress Dor held enormous influence in court. In the year that Wu Di came to the throne, 141, a call was sent out for provincial administrators to recommend people who were, quoting from the Book of Han, capable and good, sincere and upright, able to speak frankly and admonish unflinchingly, to come to court so they could advise the new emperor and be appointed to government officers. Calls like this had been made since the reign of Gaudi. The recommended were set an exam with questions about the art of governance. Something that made the summons of 141 unique was that the examinees who gave responses that reflected legalist thinking were deliberately discriminated against. It's not exactly clear to me why this exclusion was made, in the Book of Han, the Chancellor, Wei Wan, is credited with making the suggestion, though his biography in the records doesn't mention it and doesn't provide any clues about why he would make such a decision. Historian Feng Yulan attributes the decision simply to anti-legalist bias due to their association with the Qin dynasty, however I'm not sure it's a sufficient explanation. After all, students of legalism, such as Chao Tsua, had held high government posts in the past, and Seema Chen says that Wen Di favoured legalism when appointing academicians. Even into the future of Wu Di's reign, Han Anguo, who had studied the Han Fei Zi, the defining book of legalism, was appointed to the post of imperial counsellor, and succeeding him in the post was Zhang Shu, another legalist. The Chancellor Wei Wan either retired or was dismissed in 140, Wu Di's first regnal year. This opened up the door to a new cabinet of ministers, and some people who were partial to Confucianism were able to come into positions of great power. This was mostly because one of these new men, Tian Fan, was Wu Di's maternal uncle. Due to the efforts of his sister, Empress Dowager Wang, wife of Jing Di and Wu Di's mother, he had enjoyed steady promotions in the later years of Jing Di's reign. After Wei Wan's dismissal retirement, Tian Fan was made supreme commander, 
a post that had been vacant for 10 years, while his political ally, another pro-Confucian, Duo Ying, was made Chancellor. I don't think Empress Dowager Wang helped Tian become Chancellor with the goal of spreading Confucianism. Her biography in the records doesn't mention her as holding any views on the philosophy. More likely, she just wanted to improve the position of her family. Nevertheless, Tian Fen and Duo Ying proceeded to fill the court with others who thought like them. They got Zhao Wan appointed as Imperial Counselor, and brought Wang Zhang to court as well, who within a year had become Chief of Palace Attendants. These two men were students of Master Shen Pei, a scholar who taught a particular interpretation of the Book of Odes. Shen Pei, too, was brought to Chang'an. They set to work trying to make the court more Confucian. They reformed some ceremonies and even built a new hall to be more in line with the old House of Zhou, and made laws that upheld Confucian values, such as one which exempted the children and grandchildren of those over 90 from public service, so they could care for the elderly within their family in the name of filial piety. They also persecuted their political opponents, Grand Empress Dao Jador and her faction. They tried to get Marquesas who were living in Chang'an to leave for their fiefdoms, which would have removed a lot of members of the Dor family. They also saw any excuse to charge and try members of her family and her supporters. They played their hand too far when, in 139, the Imperial Counselor, Zhao Wan, proposed to the Emperor that it be forbidden for ministers to present memorials to Empress Dowager Dor for consultation. Empress Dor, outraged, used her influence over her grandson to drain the swamp of these Confucian ministers. Zhao Wan and Wang Zhang were both imprisoned and committed suicide, while Tian Fan and Dor Ying were dismissed from office. She appointed in their stead men who were friendlier to her. Su Chang as Chancellor, and Zhuang Qingdi as Imperial Counselor. For a short while, the Confucian influence was stalled. The rapid rise and fall of this short-lived Confucian cabinet in the first two years of Wu Di's reign can be partially explained by a look at Wu Di as a person. Historian Jun Shu Zhang paints a decent portrait of what the Emperor's early life might have looked like. The previous Emperor's harem had been a place of intrigue and plots, with different wives and princes competing for the position of Empress and heir apparent and Wu Di was a child of that environment. Zhang imagines that Jing Di was a poor role model for Wu Di, distant, unaffectionate, and harsh and arbitrary when he decided to intervene in the various intrigues of the harem. His depiction of Jing Di as an uncaring father seems to me to contradict the textual evidence. Sima Chen says that Wu Di was Jing Di's favourite son. However, even with this exception, I can still accept Zhang's conclusion that as a boy, Wu Di grew suspicious of others and was pushed into trusting only his mother. This developed into a devotion to his female elders, including his grandmother, that was something of a psychological complex beyond the societal expectation of filial piety. This would explain why his mother was able to trigger an abrupt change in government, or by appointing Tian Fen as supreme commander, and then why his grandmother was able to reverse this change shortly after. Now, in 136, Woody was presented with a very important memorial from a scholar, who was at that moment serving as chancellor for the kingdom of Jiangdu. This chancellor's name was Dong Zhongshu. During the reign of Jing Di, he had been appointed as an erudite of the Han court, and he had been moved to his current office when Wu Di came to the throne. He was an expert in the spring and autumn annals, and a work, and a work attached to it called the Gongyang Commentary. And this Gongyang Commentary was an interpretation of the annals, which held that it was not just an historical record, but that it put forth Confucius's vision of a political order which could be understood through noticing supposed subtleties and hidden meanings in the sparse wording of the annals. The text of the Gong Yang is largely an exegesis uncovering these subtleties and hidden meanings. Dong in his own work quoted from the annals a lot, and thus he wrote a book that is called Chun Shou Fan Lu, Luxuriant Dew of the Spring and Autumn Annals. Dong Zhongshu's philosophy was a Confucian synthesis of all sorts of different ideas that had been bouncing around, made for the imperial age. To be honest, I'm too stupid to understand the nuances of Chinese philosophy. Vaguely speaking, what Dong Zhongshu provided was a metaphysical superstructure for Confucian ethics, which allowed Confucianism to compete with philosophies such as Taoism, which often disparaged Confucianism for being too bogged down in the messy world of man and ignoring the realm of heaven. At the same time, Dong provided room for practical techniques of government, which allowed Confucianism to stand up to legalism, the latter often accusing the former of being too idealistic. There were also some important political elements of particularly appealing to Wu Di. Dong's philosophy made the position of emperor the essential point of interaction between heaven and man. 
which was a great argument for the illegitimate authority of the Han regime. As historian Michael Lowe describes, when Liu Bang came to power and founded the Han dynasty, his claim to authority was largely based on the fact that he had conquered all his rivals to the position, as well as his claim to personal links to divine entities. As the emperorship passed down, Liu Bang's descendants couldn't really make the same claim based on conquest. They hadn't had to defeat anyone to achieve their position. Men such as Lu Jia and Jia Yi advanced the idea that it was the emperor's ethical qualities that gave him his authority. Dong Zhong Shu now emphasized the divine aspect, reviving the old Zhou idea of the mandate of heaven. This was an idea that the young emperor was happy to support as a means of propping up his claim to authority. Dong believed that natural and supernatural phenomena, such as earthquakes or sightings of mythical creatures, were related to the conduct of government, and might indicate whether policy was going in the right direction or not. It was conventional wisdom that the emperor's personal virtue, or lack thereof, could have an effect on the realms of heaven and earth, but Dong made the strongest argument yet that political decisions could have similar effects. The philosophy came to be very influential under later Han emperors, though, as we'll see, Wudi himself was not necessarily convinced by it. Another important aspect of Dong's philosophy is Sheng Wang, meaning universal kingship. This meant that the emperor's divine right extended not just over China, but to all under heaven. It was his duty to get foreign peoples to acknowledge him as their sovereign. Obviously, this was a great justification for Wudi's expansionist ambitions. Now, I must emphasize that Dong was standing on the shoulders of giants. A lot of the ideas in his book had originated with earlier thinkers. The thing that really made him stand out was how he fused all these ideas together into a working synthesis. So, in 136, Dong submitted his memorial to the emperor, which called for a unification of thought, meaning a sanctioning of Confucian thought. It read, quote, The principle of great unification in the Chun Shou, spring and autumn annals, is a permanent warp passing through the universe, and an expression of what is proper extending from the past to the present. But the teachers of today have diverse ways, men have diverse doctrines, and each of the philosophic schools has its own particular position and differs in the ideas which it teaches. Hence it is that the rulers possess nothing whereby they may effect general unification. All not within the field of the Liu Yi, six arts, should be cut short and not allowed to progress any further. These six arts refer to the ancient traditions of the Zhou dynasty, the preservation of which had been the mission of the first Confucians. They were represented by six books, the Book of Songs, the Book of Documents, the Book of Rites, the Book of Changes, the Book of Music, which by this time was a lost text, and the Spring and Autumn Annals. The proposal was accepted, and the role of the court academicians was transformed. Under the Qin dynasty, there had been 72 academicians, reflecting various schools of thought. This number and variety had been inherited by the Han. Now, the number was drastically reduced. Possibly as few as five erudites were appointed, each one an expert in one of these texts. This famous decision helped create the notion that these five books belonged as a set, and marked the beginning of Confucianism as the state-sanctioned ideology. There was still a lot of progress to make, though, before it became inextricably entwined with the governance of the dynasty. Shortly after the appointment of the five erudites, in 135, the Grand Empress Dowager Dor passed away. This opened up the field for Confucian influence to spread. Tian Fan, the supreme commander, who had been dismissed because of the Empress Dowager, made a comeback, this time being granted the highest post as Chancellor. He made another call for talented men to come to court, this time specifying for them to be, quoting from the book, filially pious and incorrupt, the former of these qualities especially being a traditional Confucian value. One of the men who came was a commoner named Gong Sun Hong, a student of the Spring and Autumn Annals. He eventually rose to the position of Imperial Counselor. Gong Sun was, quote, disturbed that the teachings of Confucius were being neglected and not put into greater practice. In 124, he was appointed Chancellor and proposed a new idea. Every year, 50 men from around the Empire should be brought to Chang'an as disciples of the academicians. At the end of the year, they would undergo an examination, and those who showed a deep understanding of one or more of the classics would be appointed to low- or mid-level government positions. Students were to be picked from, quote, Any men who are fond of learning, show respect for their superiors, adhere to the teachings of the government, and honour the customs of their village, and whose actions in no way reflect discredit upon their reputations. 
This regular cohort of 50 students was the true beginning of the Tai Swear, the Han Imperial Academy. It would produce generation after generation of men who would fill out the vast bureaucracy of the empire. Now, it's worth asking why being an expert in one of these Confucian classics would be a useful skill for a bureaucrat, and more broadly, why Confucianism, of all the schools of thought, reached this position of state ideology. Sure, Confucianism had things to say about governance, but so did all the other major philosophical schools. Gong Sun Hong himself gave a clue to why such knowledge might be useful for an official in the memorial he gave to the emperor making the proposal. There's an interesting part where he praises the style of language used in imperial edicts and ordinances, describing it as, quote, stately and orthodox, but says that it has been difficult for officials to help the common people understand these orders. Translator Burton Watson explains that imperial edicts were often written in a quite archaic and vague form of language, which made lots of allusions to classical texts. Therefore, having men who were trained classicists posted in the various points of government throughout the empire would be helpful in properly interpreting and applying the edicts. Of course, this begs the question of why the edicts were written in this esoteric manner in the first place. There were more reasons why Confucianism may have been appealing on a broader level. Historian Fang Yor Lan considers its ascendancy to have been, quote, almost inevitable. The world of the Han Dynasty made certain demands that Confucianism was particularly suited to fulfilling. The Qin Dynasty had brought to an end the old feudal bloodlines and the authority that went with them. With the founding of the Han, there was a new class of aristocrats, mostly drawn from commoners who had fought for Gaozu. These men and their successors needed something that could distinguish them from the masses, and Confucianism could provide that in its expertise on ancient rituals and ceremonies, which it had always considered to be a means of distinguishing the high from the low. Also, like most ancient societies, Maintaining a connection to the past was very important to the Chinese, and as the Confucians were first and foremost classicists, this was another thing they could offer that other schools couldn't. While books that were central to other traditions, such as the Legalists' Book of Lord Shang and the Taoists' Classic of the Way and the Virtue, came from the Warring States era, the Confucian classics, the documents, the odes, and the others, had their origins in the Fort Majeure period. Historian Mark Edward Lewis elaborates on why this connection to antiquity was useful to the state. After 154 BC, when the revolt of the Seven Kingdoms was defeated, military power became a less visible manifestation of authority. After all, China was more peaceful and secure than it had been for a long time. This meant that the state needed to reform its image to maintain its legitimacy. Having the biggest army in China was not enough anymore. Instead, the Han began to claim that it was, quoting Lewis, the patron of Chinese civilization. Endorsement of Confucian learning, a tradition focused on classical texts, was the key method of making this claim. As Feng points out, these things made Confucianism a fairly conservative doctrine, but at the same time it contained that revolutionary element that had been there from the start, and was still just as important now. The Junzi, the superior man, was defined by his personal moral quality, not his birth. Sure, the fact that it was hard for a working class person to get an education was a major obstacle to attaining the Confucian vision of virtue, but he could, in theory, become a Junzi. Thus, it was conservative enough to be palatable to the elite, but at the same time it had the room for the sort of meritocracy that was necessary to govern an empire. As well as these things that were in Confucianism's favour, Feng notes some deficiencies in other major philosophies, that prevented them from achieving the same sort of position. Legalism, despite having the most practical approach to government, had been tarnished by the Qin dynasty. Rightly or wrongly, Han commentators blamed legalism for Qin's downfall, making it very unlikely that legalism could reclaim the position of state ideology it held under Qin. Statesmen would continue to use legalist methods into the future, and many of the institutions that Han inherited from Qin were legalist in conception. However, the philosophy would have to live on as a sort of underground, unacknowledged influence. Openly describing oneself as a student of Shang Yang or Han Fei became impossible, and according to Feng, it became a common accusation in imperial China to say certain rulers or statesmen were, quote, Confucianists in appearance, but legalists in reality. As for Taoism, the third major school, Feng says that it had its uses, especially for the early period of the dynasty, but also its limitations. Its principle of non-intervention had been useful in helping China recover after the destruction of revolution against Qin and the subsequent civil war. 
However, that process of recovery had now been achieved, and clinging to the Taoist model was needlessly restrictive to a government that wanted to undertake major projects. The Huang Lao doctrine of Taoism that so far had been the closest thing to a consensus ideology for the Han, explicitly advised against military aggression, which did not at all fit Wudi's vision. Feng says that throughout the history of Imperial China, the different focuses of the two schools of thought meant that the philosophical pendulum tended towards Taoism in times of chaos and to Confucianism in times of order. Well, at least for now, chaos had been overcome and order achieved. If those are some suggestions as to why Confucianism, out of all the other schools of thought, became the state ideology, we're led to another question. Why did there have to be a state ideology at all? I think in the modern world we often consider orthodoxy a negative force. We appreciate diversity of thought because of the new ideas that can be produced through debate. Having an officially sanctioned ideology feels stifling an obstacle to evolution. Nevertheless, we do have certain tenets that we expect everyone, or at least our politicians, to agree on. If we live in a democracy, we want our politicians to believe in the principles of democracy. If we live in a country governed by a constitution, we expect the state to abide by it. Even in something like scientific, or indeed historical research, the community of experts has an agreed upon methodology so that they can determine what is valid and invalid. Thus, we can see that having certain beliefs that everyone shares can be very important and valuable, even in the modern age. It seems to me that orthodoxy would be even more important for an ancient state than a modern one, where the instruments of government weren't as fully fleshed out as they usually are now. If, say, the Premier of Victoria decided that the state was going to secede from the rest of Australia, there are so many obstacles in his way that it's kind of inconceivable that he'd even make such a declaration. On the other hand, if the governor of some frontier commandery, or the king of one of the feudal kingdoms, decided that they would stop listening to the emperor, well, it would be tricky, but they'd have a decent chance of getting away with it for a while. Having everyone in an official post believe in a particular ideology was one way of decreasing the chances of something like that happening. In Chinese philosophical writings, both pre- and post-imperial, diversity in thought is often seen as quite a negative thing, a symptom of chaos. One of the best examples of this vision is from the Taoist text, Zhuangzi. Quote, There ensued great disorder in the world, and sages and worthies no longer shed light on it. The Tao and its characteristics ceased to be regarded as uniform. Many in different places got one glimpse of it, and plumed themselves on possessing it as a whole. They might be compared to the ear, the eye, the nose, or the mouth. Each sense has its own faculty, but their different faculties cannot be interchanged. So it was with the many branches of the various schools. Each had its peculiar excellence, and there was the time for the use of it. But notwithstanding, no one covered or extended over the whole range of truth. Alas, the various schools held on their several ways, and could not come back to the same point, nor agree together. The students of that later age, unfortunately, did not see the undivided purity of heaven and earth and the great scheme of truth held by the ancients. The system of the Tao was about to be torn in fragments all under the sky. It acknowledges that the various schools had their particular utilities and areas of expertise, but laments that they had not come together to form a singular, pure vision. Confucian philosopher Sun Quang connected philosophical disorder with political disorder. Quote, There are no two ways for the world, and the sage is not of two minds. Nowadays, the feudal lords have different, have different governments, and the hundred schools have different teachings, so that necessarily some are right and some are wrong, some lead to order and some to chaos. Student of Sun Quang, legalist thinker Han Fei, proposed a state monopoly on learning, so that people wouldn't be distracted by various philosophies. Quote, In the state of the enlightened sovereign, there is no literature written on bamboo scripts, but the law is the only teaching. There are no quoted sayings of the early kings, but the magistrates are the only instructors. Scholars borrowed ideas from other schools, trying to take what was best, but it was always with the view of describing a philosophy that was totally comprehensive. Of course, when the Qin came to power, the Chancellor Li Si, through the destruction of private books, tried to achieve the sort of philosophical hegemony that Han Fei had advocated, with legalism as the approved ideology. That hegemony collapsed with the chin. 
Now were they, or at least his underlings, were trying to do the same thing, but with Confucianism as the sanctioned philosophy. Several modern-day historians have accused the Han Dynasty of hypocrisy when it came to intellectual policy. According to Han writers, the greatest atrocity of the Qin Dynasty was the burning of the books and the burying of the scholars, which they portrayed as an attack on scholarship in general, and Confucianism in particular. But as we discussed in the episode on the Qin Dynasty, this was not an entirely accurate picture. Furthermore, now that the Han was setting its own state ideology, it seems to have been following the Qin example. Historian Mark Edward Lewis says, quote, Contrary to Han claims, their own intellectual policies in the early Han period followed Qin precedent. The Han's establishment of the classical Confucian canon as state orthodoxy represented not a radical reversal of the Qin practice, but simply a narrowing of scope. Amateur historian Sunny Y. Ao Yang, in fact, deplores the triumph of Confucianism over legalism. If you remember from those Qin episodes, there were a lot of aspects of legalism that we could consider progressive. The philosophy emphasised equal application of the law, understanding of the law even amongst the uneducated, and objective, consequence-based reasoning. She says, quote, Legalists' rule by law would be replaced by the Confucian rule by men. The law's impartiality, substantiality, and understandability by the common people would be eclipsed by the privileges and inscrutable virtues claimed by superior men in powerful positions. The bureaucratic rationality of organisation by function and evaluation according to performance would be corrupted by patrimonial and feudalistic practices, especially the preponderance of personal connections. I think there's a lot to be said for her criticisms. However, there are other historians who side more with the Han's intellectual policy than the Chin's. Feng Yulan points out that the Han's unification of thought was more about promoting one school over the rest, rather than silencing opposing schools. There was no punishment prescribed for private education of whatever type. It was simply that if you wanted to work for the government, you needed Confucian training. Jun Shu Zhang sees the Confucian synthesis of Dong Zhong Shu and other scholars as a more comprehensive and adaptable ideology than Li Si's legalism. He says, quote, the reformation of Confucianism really led to the formation of a new paradigm of Confucian theory, of statecraft, by absorbing all the practical and idealist elements in the political thought of the legalist, Huang Lao, later Taoist, Moist, Yin Yang, and military science schools, while retaining the pristine ideas of earlier Confucianism and Sun Tzu's Confucianism. In the end, unlike the previous state ideology of legalism under the Qin by the first emperor since 213 BC, which was too exclusive to last long. The new syncretic Confucianism emerged as the most acceptable and all-embracing ideology for a new political regime, and the least exclusive doctrine and the most ambitious paradigm of statecraft. In fact, it was to be the state-endorsed ideology in the Chinese Empire for most of the next 2,000 years, though many new reformations had to be made for its survival in changing times. As for me, I'm not well versed enough in Chinese philosophy or history to judge for myself. However, I do think there's something to be said for the empirical evidence. As Zhang says, Confucianism proved itself workable enough to serve as an ideology basically until the end of the empire. Before I finish talking directly about the rise of Confucianism though, I should say that despite the finality with which I presented it here, the process was not, com was not yet complete by the end of Wu Di's reign. Historian Liang Tsai questions the traditional narrative, which usually portrays Wu Di's reign as the time when Confucianism triumphed over other ideologies, using an interesting method. By collecting information from the records in the Book of Han, she compiled the data necessary to make statistical statements about the ideologies held by Han officials, or at least the ideologies ascribed to them in the standard histories. Her work shows that despite the efforts of men like Dong Zhong Shu and Gong Sun Hong, Confucians remained a minority faction in the government during Wu Di's time on the throne. Of the twelve men who served as chancellor under Wu Di, only one, Gong Sun Hong, was identified as a Confucianist. Although Tian Fen and Duo Ying were described as sympathetic to Confucianism, neither was actually a scholar of any of the classics. Furthermore, none of the seven chancellors who succeeded Gong Sun Hong was a product of the Imperial Academy examination system which he had created. Even when we look at things through a larger aperture, the conclusions are the same. 
the most senior positions in the Han bureaucracy were the three excellencies, that is, the Chancellor, Imperial Counselor, and Supreme Commander, the nine ministers, and the senior officials of the Metropolitan Region. 141 different people reached these positions in Wudi's reign. Of these, 77 can be identified. Of the 77, only six were described as Confucianists. Gong Sun Hong was the only one who rose to prominence through Tian Fen's recommendation system, and Ni Quan was the only man who came from the Imperial Academy. In fact, it seems that the majority of the officials were not labelled with any particular ideology at all. Two of the 77, Ji An and Zheng Dang Shi, were called Taoists or followers of Huang Lao thought, and two more, Han Ang Guo and Zhang Shi, were identified as legalists. This leaves 67 of the 77 identified of of the 77 identified officials as not belonging to any particular school of thought. Liang Tsai's methods suggest that it was not until after Wu Di that Confucianism became a powerful political force. The combined reigns of the next three emperors totaled 54 years, the same length as Wu Di's reign. 140 people achieved those most senior positions. 74 of them can be identified. Of these 74, 24 were called Confucianists, a significant minority and a larger number than any other school of thought. Liang's findings show that the efforts of men like Dong Zhongshu and Gong Sung Hong did not bring about an overnight transformation in the type of person who filled out the Han bureaucracy. However, it was the institutions they created that facilitated the change under later emperors, and I do think there's something to be said for the disproportionate influence a single man can have. There are also some limitations to Liang's method. There, th- there are the problems that are inherent to working with the sources. As we saw, of the 141 eminent officials in Wudi's reign, only 77, little more than half, can be identified. And we can say nothing of the hundreds, the thousands of men working in lower level positions. Also, it only considers men who were identified as Confucianists or Ru in the records in the Book of Han, but discounts those who were described as sympathetic to Confucianism, like Tian Fen and Dor Ying, but who were not called Ru because they were not scholars in any of the classics. So, while Liang's work is an important qualification, I'm not sure we can completely chuck out the standard narrative of Wu Di's reign being a time of rising Confucianism. <laughs> Alongside the ascendancy of Confucianism, there was a more general cultural flourishing under Wu Di's reign. Aside from Dong Zhongshu's contributions to philosophy, two names stand out as leaving an important legacy for Chinese literature as a whole. One of these was Sima Xiong Ru, who made important innovations in poetry. The other was Sima Chan, whose form of historical writing set the standard for subsequent official histories. Though they had the same family name, they were not closely related. There are some interesting parallels connecting their careers. Firstly, while neither are usually classified as Confucians, both took some inspiration from the Confucian ideology, but ended up being criticised by Confucian Puritans. Secondly, both of their works contained veiled criticisms of Wu Di. Seamus Yang Ru's life was so archetypically that of an artist that it's almost funny. He was born to a wealthy family in the southwestern bordery commandery Shu, and showed an interest in literature from a young age. During this time, he changed his given name to Xiang Ru, basing it off a statesman of antiquity whom he admired. Like a lot of young men from wealthy families, he ended up being sent to Chang'an to work as a palace attendant during the reign of Emperor Jing. On one occasion while he was there, the King of Liang came to court to pay homage to the Emperor, and brought with him a number of rhetoricians from his court. These rhetoricians inspired Sima Xiang Ru so much that he decided to abandon his job at the capital, and instead try to join the court of Liang. While he was there, he wrote a poem titled Zisu, meaning something like Sir Fantasy. It concerned an imaginary dialogue between two lords of the feudal states of Qi and Chu, describing the fantastic hunting parks of their kings. 
When the king of Liang died, Seima returned to his hometown, only to find that his family had grown poor and there, were no ma- and there was no means of getting work. However, he happened to be friends with the magistrate of the nearby county, Lin Xiong, who invited him to come there. Because of the time he had spent at the imperial court and the court of Liang, Seima was now treated like a guest of honour. Two, th- two wealthy men of Lin Xiong decided to throw a party for him, where he was invited to play the lute. Initially, he was hesitant, but somehow he learned that the daughter of one of the men was secretly watching and listening to the party from the more private quarters of the house. This woman, Zhuo Wenjun, was young and recently widowed. She had heard news of Seima Xiangru's arrival in Lin Xiong, and had become curious about this poet from such high society. Now aware that Zhuo was watching, Seima consented to play the lute a little. Watching this young, somewhat famous man pluck away at the instrument in her own home was enough for Zhuo to fall in love with him. That night, they eloped together and galloped to Seima's hometown, Chengdu. Zhuo's father was deeply upset with her and refused to send her any money to help her get started with her new life. At the same time, Seima faced the same problem that had caused him to go to Lin Xiong in the first place. There was no work for him in Chengdu. All they had was an empty one-room house and the horses and carriage they had run away with. Thus, the couple eventually decided to return to Lin Xiong, Zhuo knowing that she would be able to borrow some money from her relatives. When they got to town, they sold their horses and carriage and opened up a wine shop. Zhuo minded the shop during the day while Seema did manual labour around the marketplace. Gradually, they saved up a bit of cash. When Zhuo's father found out what she was doing with herself, he was deeply ashamed. However, some of his friends and relatives convinced him to stop being so stuck up. He only had three children and a lot of wealth. Surely he could spare some for her. Moreover, they recognised that while Seema was poor at the moment, he had a lot of potential. He wasn't such a bad husband for her, they said. The father finally caved in and gave Seema and Zhuo a hundred servants and a million cash. With this under their belt, they were able to return to Chengdu and buy some land to farm. Around this time, Seema arranged for someone he knew in Chang'an to present his poem Sir Fantasy to Wu Di. Wu Di was so impressed by it that he assumed it must have been written by some ancient author. When he learned that in fact the author was still alive, he immediately summoned Seema to Chang'an. Seema and his wife Zhuo answered the summons, and when he met the emperor, he humbly proposed that he write a new section to add on to the poem to write about the emperor's own hunting park, Shang Lin, in addition to those of the kings of Qi and Shu. Excited, Wu Di provided Seima with the tools he needed to get to work. The end product is recorded in the records. The way it plays out is that Sir Fantasy speaks about the glories of the king of Chu's hunting park. He is then rebuked by Master No Such of Qi, who criticises Sir Fantasy for celebrating the extravagant indulgence of his king, rather than seeing his virtues only to then describe his own king's lavish hunts. Then, Lord Not Real, speaking for the emperor, sings a long, fabulous poem describing the Shang Lin Park, but then describes how, after a day's hunt, the emperor feels ashamed about wasting so much money on his own pleasure, while ignoring the welfare of his subjects. He proceeds to open up his hunting lands for use by the common people. One particular section, which seems in keeping with the Confucian values of the time, explains how part of the emperor's virtue and duty is to propagate and embody classical learning. It won't fully make sense, but you just have to know that it's chock full of references to classical songs and ceremonies. Quote, He swarts now in the park of the six arts, races upon the road of benevolence and righteousness, and scans the forest to the spring and autumn annals. His archery now is to the stately measures of the foxhead and the beast of virtue. His prey is the dance of the black cranes, performed with ceremonial shield and battle-axe. Casting the heavenly cloud-net, he snares the songs of the Book of Odes, sighs over the felling of the sandalwood, and delights in the ruler who shares his joy with all. He ends his deportment in the Garden of Rites, and wanders in the orchard of the Book of Documents. He spreads the teachings of the Book of Changes. He sets forth the strange beasts penned in his park, ascends the bright hole, and seats himself in the Temple of the Ancestors. Although his poem is usually interpreted as being a subtle jab at Wu Di for his own extravagant hunting parties, it was, well re- it was very well received by the emperor. Seema was reinstated as a palace attendant. 
Another theme that Seymour expressed in his work, which was in keeping with the sensibilities of the age, was an imperialist attitude. Seymour himself was actually involved in some of the expansion southwest, which we talked about last episode. In 135, an official named Tang Meng was leading a diplomatic military expedition to the southwest, which resulted in the establishment of the commandery Jianwei. In the course of carrying out his mission, he abused something called the military supply law in order to execute Chinese officials in the Shu and Ba commanderies, who weren't being helpful enough to his expedition. The Emperor sent Sima, a native of Shu, to try and smooth things out. Later, Sima himself led a diplomatic mission to some of the barbarian tribes in order to convince them to come over to China, which succeeded in adding several new counties to the Shu commandery. He sent an interesting letter to the Emperor, in which, according to Sima Chen, he used officials of Shu as mouthpiece to explain some practical difficulties he was facing in his mission, while he himself presented the ideological argument for why the expansion was necessary. He didn't want to voice his complaints directly for fear of punishment. The passages supporting the expansion are reflective of the idea of universal kingship that Dong Zhong Shu had advocated, and also make allusions to classical texts. Here's one particular section. Quote, When a truly wise ruler has ascended the throne, how can you expect him to give his attention only to petty deeds and trifles, to be bound by the letter of custom and led by common ways, to abide only by the stories and traditions of the past, seeking nothing more than the approval and delight of his own generation? Rather will he honour lofty ideas and far-sighted proposals, embark upon new undertakings to ensure the continuance of the dynasty, and provide a model for ten thousand ages to admire. Thus will he strive with all his might to bring new lands and people beneath his sway, and expend every thought to match the virtue of the life-giving earth, with, and with the earth and heaven to form a triad. Is it not said in the odes, Beneath all heaven there is no land that is not the king's, throughout the borders of the earth, none who are not his subjects. Therefore, within the six directions, and beyond the eight corners of the earth, wherever his virtue flows, if there is any creature that is not touched and transformed by his mercy, the wise ruler considers it a source of shame. Now within the border of the nation, the men of China, with their hats and girdles, all enjoy the highest blessing, and none are excluded or left out. But in the lands of the strange-mannered barbarians, in, this distant, in the distant regions of the foreigners, where our boats and carriages cannot penetrate and our people seldom set foot, the teachings of our government are as yet unknown, and the wind of virtue which issues from our sovereign blows but faintly. Therefore, when they enter our borders, they turn their backs upon duty and insult propriety, while within their own lands they commit all manner of wanton evil, banishing or assassinating their leaders. Among them, ruler and subject change places, honourable and lowly are confounded, fathers and elders suffer for crimes they have not committed, and children and orphans are taken as slaves, bound and weeping. Then do they look toward our land and cry out in anger, saying, We have heard that in China there is a ruler of supreme benevolence, whose virtue is manifold and whose mercy is all-embracing, so that under him all beings find their just place. Why are we alone deprived of his blessing? On tiptoe they stand, gazing longingly like men in drought at a distant rainstorm. Even the cruelest of men would shed tears for them. How much more, then, must a great sage like our ruler be moved to pity by their plight? So, even though he had some hesitations about how feasible the expansion west was, he clearly thought it was the right thing to do. Now, while he was in Shu, on his mission to the southwest, Zhuo Wenjun's father fully reconciled with his daughter and her husband, and he gave them a nice bit of real estate. Zhuo actually wrote some of her own poetry as well. A poem called Song of the Snow White Heads is attributed to her. Eventually, Sima became sick, and retired from Wudi's court to their new house. He died in 117 BC. When he heard the news, the emperor sent men to Sima's house to see if he had left any poetry behind. However, when they got there and spoke to Seema's wife, she told him that he had only left a letter, with instructions to give it to the emperor once he had died. The letter sang praises of the Han, and urged Wu Di to perform the religious ceremonies known as the Feng and Shan sacrifices, and to make a record of the event. One part read, quote, We beg you, at the same time, to set forth a true record of the deed, couched in rich and sonorous language, so that it may stand beside the spring and autumn annals. Then will a seventh classic be added to the former six, to be handed down for ages everlasting, that all, pros- that all posterity may be washed by the clear currents of your virtue, and lifted upon its spreading waves, that the fame of such a virtue may be noised abroad, and its previous worth be known to all. 
despite some minor objections he may have had about the Emperor's hunting parties, Seema was clearly a believer in Wu Di and his empire. However, his career was not without censure. Confucian purists objected to some of the more fantastical elements of his poetry. From the orthodox point of view, poetry ought to be serious, straightforward, and deal with real-world subjects, like the style of the verses contained in the Book of Odes. However, Seema was more inspired by another ancient collection of poetry, the Songs of Chu, which preserved the more imaginative and expressive poems of the South. His description of the Shanglin Park in his poem on the matter delved well into the fantastical. One section describes towers that reach the heavens, mythical creatures, and visits from immortals. Quote, so lofty the palaces that comets stream through their portals, and rainbows twine about their balustrades. Green dragons slither from the eastern pavilion. Elephant-carved carriages prance from the pure hole of the west, bringing immortals to dine in the peaceful towers, and bands of fairies to sun themselves beneath the southern eaves. Such tosh would not fly with classicist purists, and in fact, when the official copy of Seymour's work was made for the Imperial Library, the sections describing the Shangling Park and the hunting parts of Chu were omitted, on the grounds that, quote, the extravagant language of the poet had overstepped the bounds of reality, and displayed too little respect for the dictates of reason and good sense. Luckily, Seema Chen seems to have had access to the full version, and reproduced it in the records. Interestingly enough, the biography of Seema Xiang Ru seems to suggest that Wu Di himself enjoyed the more extravagant and fantastic elements of his work. The Emperor was very interested in the idea of eternal life, and especially liked the parts of Seema's poems that dealt with immortal beings. Seema once wrote a poem called The Mighty One for Wu Di, and we are told in the records that in writing the poem, he considered that traditional representations of immortals, wherein they were humble, hermit-like figures living in swamps and hills, would not be appealing to Wu Di's tastes, and instead wrote in the same extravagant style that he used in his description of Shanglin Park. The emperor was apparently delighted with the poem, and declared, quote, that it made him feel as though he were already whirling away over the clouds and filled him with a longing to wander about the earth and the heavens. It seems that Wu Di did not share the same taste in literature as the classicists whom he was promoting. He is said to have written poetry himself, and some of the works attributed to him are considered fairly good. Here's one called The Autumn Wind. Autumn wind rises, white clouds fly. Grass and trees wither, geese go south. Orchards all in bloom, chrysanthemums smell sweet. I think of my lovely lady, I never can forget. Floating pagoda boat crosses Fen River. Across the midstream, white waves rise. Flute and drum keep time to the sound of the rower's song. Amidst revel and feasting, sad thoughts come. Youth's years, how few. Age, how sure. Another contribution Weedy made to poetry was the invention of the Music Bureau, circa 114. Its main purpose was to compose and preserve songs for use in religious practices and court ritual. Many of the works attributed to it resemble folk songs, and historian Mark Edward Lewis says that they are characterised by, quote, impersonality and detachment in presentation, stereotyped situations or plots, lack of introspection, ahistoricity, abrupt transitions, use of commonplace phrases, recurring refrains, and colloquialism. However, they also incorporated classical language, along with vernacular, and were intended for court use, so they weren't pure folk. Other songs attributed to the Bureau tell more complex narratives, and make references to historical or literary figures, which show that they were intended for an educated crowd. Some were more similar to the works of Seema Xiang Ru, focusing on fantastical subjects. So, the other literary figure I mentioned was Seema Chen, with whom we should already be somewhat familiar. He was the main author of the Records of the Grand Historian, which has been my key primary source since the start of the podcast. However, I've yet to provide a full biography of the man, so I'll do that, as well as talk a bit about how he relates to Confucianism. If you'd like to hear a bit more about the actual form of the records, I'd suggest listening to the supplementary episode I did about the standard histories. As a disclaimer, what we know of Seema's life is basically all from the final chapter of the records, which is his autobiography. Seema's ancestors had held the post of Taishi for the Zhou court in the pre-imperial era, this office is usually translated as Grand Historian, however it actually originated as something a bit different. 
The earliest meaning of the word she is believed to have been an official whose duty it was to record hits and misses in archery contests. In Jaw times, the she became responsible for tracking astronomical events, which were interpreted to select auspicious days for the king to perform certain rituals. Their duties expanded into recording other divine omens, and eventually they started making records of affairs of state, which became the first official chronicles. In hand times, keeping an historical record was not actually part of the official duties of the Grand Historian. However, because of the history of the office, there was an association between the duties that the Grand Historian performed and writing records. Seymour was born at a time when his family were living as farmers somewhere along the Yellow River. From childhood, Seymour showed an interest in history and literature, and he learned how to read classical texts at a young age. At the ascension of Emperor Wu, Seymour's father, Tan, received a job as Grand Historian. Tan focused mostly on the astronomical aspects of the job, as was expected of him. However, he deeply wished he could live up to his ancestors and make some sort of historical record. Qian spent his early adulthood travelling around China, and at some point began his first government job as an attendant of the Emperor. In 110 BC, he went southwest in connection with the campaigns and new commanderies that had been set up following the war with Nanyue. In this same year, the emperor performed the Feng and Shan sacrifices, a very important and exceptional religious ritual that had not been performed by any emperor since the Qin dynasty. Normally, Sima Tam would have been there as part of the imperial entourage and witnessed the ceremony. However, he had fallen fatally ill and was unable to attend. This was deeply upsetting to him, because he felt that it was his duty as Grand Historian to make a record of such an event. Instead, Chan went along to observe. When Chan returned, Tan was on his deathbed. Tan was regretful in his final moments. He felt that he had been unable to complete his duty to make a record of the important events of his age. He said to his son, quote, Our ancestors were Grand Historians for the House of Jor. From the most ancient times they were eminent and renowned, when in the days of Yu and Xia they were in charge of astronomical affairs. In later ages our family declined. Will this tradition end with me? If you in turn become Grand Historian, you must continue the work of our ancestors. Now the House of Han has arisen and all the world is united under one rule. I have been Grand Historian, and yet I have failed to set forth a record of all the enlightened rulers and wise lords, the faithful ministers and gentlemen who were ready to die for duty. I am fearful that the historical materials will be neglected and lost. You must remember and think of this. Custom mandated a three-year mourning period for the loss of a parent. After Seymour Chen had completed this, he fulfilled his father's wishes and managed to become Grand Historian. Once he attained the post, he started working in private from the materials his father had left him, a project that became the records of the Grand Historian. The most famous incident of his career was when he argued in defence of General Li Ling, after the latter was defeated by the Xiongnu in 99 BC. Wu Di was very upset with Li, and was upset at Seymour for defending him. Seymour was sentenced to death. Such a punishment could be commuted by a fine or castration. Seymour could not afford the former, so he decided to endure the shame of the latter. He reflected that many of the great classics were supposed to have been written when their authors were in the throes of despair of some form or another. Surely, he too then could tolerate being a eunuch in order to complete his great work. The records was probably finished around 94 BC, with two original manuscripts, one at the capital and one somewhere else as a backup copy. He died about 10 years later. The two great works of Chinese history that preceded the records, the Book of Documents and the Spring and Autumn Annals, were both amongst the five classics, so Seymour couldn't help but be influenced by classical learning. He especially took inspiration from the annals, and may have even seen himself as following the footsteps of Confucius. In his autobiography, he recounted a lecture that his father gave him. Quote, My father used to say to me, 500 years after the Duke of Jor died, Confucius appeared. It has now been 500 years since the death of Confucius. There must be someone who can succeed to the enlightened ages of the past, who can set the transmission of the Book of Changes, continue the spring and autumn annals, and searched into the world of the odes and documents, the rites and music. Was this not his ambition? How can I, his son, dare to neglect his will? Now, the Spring and Autumn Annals is a peculiar work. I've talked a bit about it already in relation to Dong Zhongshu, as well as in earlier episodes. However, it's worth recapping. 
The annals itself is a very bare-bones record of events in the feudal state of Lu. The core of the annals is barely even what you would consider a history book. It's just a year-by-year chronicle, with very little narrative sense. However, since at least the time of Mencius, it was believed that Confucius himself had some role in editing or compiling the annals, and thus it received a lot of attention from scholars. There are three commentaries on the annals that have become classics in their own right, and two of these were in existence by Seema's lifetime, the Gongyang Commentary and the Zhuo Commentary. Both sought to interpret meaning from the sparse words of the annals. Historian and translator Burton Watson extracts from them two major contradictory tenets. Firstly, that the historian should be an impartial observer, and secondly, that the historian ought to use history to communicate moral judgments. The commentaries held that sometimes Confucius, in writing the annals, was attempting to be objective, making notes of events without inputting his biases, and avoiding claims of fact when he was unsure of a particular matter, and at other times, he supposedly used subtle hints of language, omitted or even falsified facts, in order to illustrate some ethical point. Both the Gongyang and Zhuo commentaries interpret the annals in these ways, although the Gongyang school tended to emphasise the annals more as a work of moral judgments, and the Zhuo as a work of history. Luckily for us, Seema took the form of these interpretations, the idea that the historian should aim for objectivity as his key precept. He was diligent in his research. Many of the notes at the end of his chapters mention how he read some primary source or interviewed someone who was related to the topic of the chapter. There's nothing that suggests that he made deliberate distortions of fact, as Confucius was attested to have done. Watson says, quote, Criticism may be made here and there of the way in which Seema Chen applied his methods of historiography, or the degree of success with, to which he realised his aim. But these methods and aims themselves, as he explains them, would do credit to a historian in any age. However, he inevitably took some influence from the other side of what the annals was supposed to be, a work of moral instruction. And indeed, as historians today will tell you, it's impossible to write a truly objective history. For the most part, though, Seema made his judgments in ways that don't interfere too much with his goal as being his, as historically accurate as possible. One obvious method is in the remarks he makes at the end of each chapter, which often relay Seema's personal thoughts on the subject. Another way which is a bit interesting is done by using the peculiar form of the records. Because the records is largely a collection of biographies of people whose lifetimes overlapped, the events of a single person's life can be scattered in several different chapters, in their own and in other chapters in which they appear as a side character. In some cases, it seems that Sema puts the episodes that reflect well on a person in their own biographies so that the reader can view them with sympathy, while leaving episodes that reflect less well on the person to be recounted in other chapters. One great instance of this involves an event we talked about in episode 3, Liu Bang and Liu Bang versus Xiang Yu. If you remember, there was one point where Liu Bang and Xiang Yu had a confrontation at Guangwu. Xiang Yu challenged Liu Bang to single combat so that a victor could be decided and peace be brought about at last. But Liu Bang refused, saying that he was physically weaker and preferred to win using his mind. This particular exchange is recorded in the chapter on Xiang Yu, but not the one on Liu Bang, because it shows Liu to be a somewhat dishonourable character. After the challenge, Liu addressed Xiang with an impressive speech, detailing the crimes Xiang Yu had committed. The enumeration of Xiang Yu's offences appears in Liu Bang's chapter, but not Xiang Yu's. Also, when the biography of a, t- of a particular person shows them in a particularly bad light, Seema sometimes includes a positive point about them in his concluding remarks, to offset the negative image. Thus, after reading the chapter on Empress Liu, where we learn all about the evil palace intrigues she was involved in. Seema notes that during her reign, China was for the most part peaceful and stable. These apparent attempts to increase the reader's sympathy for a subject, Watson believes, are directly inspired by the annals. The Gongyang commentary says that sometimes facts which would reflect badly on a particular person are avoided for the sake of, quote, those who deserve to be honoured, those who are closely related to one, and those who are virtuous. If indeed sympathy for certain figures was Seema's goal, then his methods of merely relocating certain information and adding his own thoughts were a lot more agreeable than the omissions attributed to the annals. Some contemporary historians have made more serious accusations about Seema Chan's objectivity though. Liang Tsai, that historian who did the sort of statistical analysis of senior bureaucrats, 
blames the records chapter entitled Biographies of the Confucian Scholars for creating the false impression of Wudi's reign as the time when Confucianism became a commonly held ideology of Han officialdom. She describes the chapter as, quote, manipulated political history, and sees it as a carefully crafted narrative designed to give hope to Wu scholars who were in reality politically sidelined, rather than an attempt to give an accurate overview of the state of Confucianism in Wudi's reign. She doesn't lay the blame entirely at Sima Chen, though. She criticises modern scholars for focusing too heavily on that chapter, at the expense of other stories in the records, which helped develop a more balanced picture. Aside from this mild moralising and politicising, the records also imitates the annals in some other ways, in regards to form and phraseology. Historian Mark Edward Lewis suggests that the annals biography structure of the records could be a deliberate mirror of the core text commentary structure of the annals and its commentaries. The basic annals chapter of the records gives an outline of the major events that occurred during a particular dynasty or the reign of a particular emperor, while the biographies and other chapters provide more details on, the, on these events. The core text of the Spring and Autumn Annals contains brief statements of fact, which the commentaries sometimes attempt to flesh out with a bit more historical context. Seema also uses certain phrases that seem like allusions to the annals or other writings of Confucius. Most notably, as pointed out by Burton Watson, the final paragraph of the Gongyang commentary includes the statement, quote, Confucius ordered the principles of the spring and autumn in order to await the sages of later years, for he considered that other gentlemen would also take delight in them. Similarly, in the final lines of the final chapter of the records, Seema says that he has secured the two copies of the work so that, quote, they shall await the sages and scholars of later ages. I think it's clear that Seema was deeply inspired by Confucius and the spring and autumn annals. Nevertheless, he came under fire in later ages for straying from Confucian orthodoxy. The records was often suspected of having a Taoist slant, probably because Seema included in the final chapter an essay by his father on the different schools of thought, in which Seema Tang concluded that Taoism was the most comprehensive of the various philosophies. Now, Seema probably included this essay more as a tribute to his father than because he necessarily agreed with its conclusions, but even so, it spoiled the work in the eyes of Puritans. Another issue was that Seema's portrayals of some of the Han emperors, particularly Wu Di and Gao Zhu, were not entirely flattering. The records contain several episodes which portray Gao Zhu as a bit of a bogan, with him doing things like urinating in scholars' hats and play tackling a minister to the ground after he was caught having sex with one of his concubines, and some instances of downright villainy, such as when he threw his children out of his carriage as he was escaping Xiang Yu's cavalry. This didn't jive well with later Han Dynasty representations, which portrayed Gao Zhu and the other early rulers positively, as laying the groundworks for the Confucian state. As for Wudi, well, seeing as Seema was sentenced to death and ended up being castrated for upsetting the emperor, it's understandable that he may have harboured some unfavourable thoughts towards the reigning monarch. It was risky enough to directly criticise Gao Zhu. How much more than when it came to an emperor who was still alive and clearly found it difficult to take dissenting opinions well? At the end of his chapter on the Xiongnu, Sima makes a non sequitur statement about the spring and autumn annals, which is a warning to the reader that he cannot be as direct as he would like to be when talking about contemporary issues. He says, quote, When Confucius wrote the spring and autumn annals, he was very open in treating the reigns of Yin and Huan, the early dukes of Lu. But when he came to the latter period of Duke Sting and I, his writing was much more covert. Because in the latter case he was writing about his own time, he did not express his judgments frankly, but used subtle and guarded language. It seems obvious that by making this statement, Seymour is informing the reader that he himself had to be careful when writing about Wu Di. Nevertheless, he managed to sneak in a few veiled and not so veiled jabs at the Emperor. After this reference to the annals, he goes on to say quite directly that the ruler has been following the advice of flatterers and overconfident generals when it comes to the Xiongnu, which meant that, quote, no profound achievement is ever reached. Some of the subtler attacks involve highlighting the actions of other rulers and hinting at a comparison with Wu Di. At the end of his biography on Wendy, Seema points out how Wendy, despite being recognised as a good, virtuous emperor, declined to perform the Feng and Shan sacrifices or reform the calendar, which would have indicated the beginning of a new phase of the five element cycle. If you remember, the Qin dynasty had supposedly esteemed the element of water, 
and even after the hand was founded, water continued to be the honoured element. It was considered that the hand couldn't really proclaim a new phase until the dynasty was quite confident in itself as a stable and divinely favoured regime. Seema says, quote, Emperor Wen reigned some 40 years after the founding of Han, and his virtue was of the highest order. The time had drawn near when he might appropriately have changed the beginning of the year, altered the court investments, and performed the Feng and Shan sacrifices, but the emperor modestly declined within his reign to take such steps. Ah, was he not benevolent indeed? The rhetorical question at the end seems, to design, seems designed to invite comparison with Wu Di, who did in fact declare a new phase and perform the Feng and Shan. Given that Seema does not lavish Wu Di with the same sort of praises of humility and virtue as he does with Wendy, the passage seems to suggest that it was arrogant of Wu Di to make these changes. Another comparison that Seema makes comes at the end of the chapter titled The Balanced Standard, which is in premise a history of monetary policy. The chapter contains a narrative of deprivation during the Qin Dynasty, where the first emperor was exhausting China's resources on foreign wars and construction projects, then arise during the hand which peaked at the end of Jing Di's reign. This is the part where that famous passage describing China's prosperity, which I quoted last episode, comes from. The peak is followed by a decline during the reign of Wu Di, as more and more resources were burned up in more foreign wars. The structure of the chapter naturally invites a comparison between Wu Di and the first emperor, in his closing remarks, Seema euphemistically refers to the policies of the first emperor as the stream of circumstances, and has this to say, quote, At that time the ruler was busy driving back the barbarians from the borders of the empire, while within the empire he was carrying out various construction works and projects, so that although the men who remained at home worked the fields, they could not supply enough to eat, and though the women wove and span, they could not produce enough clothing. And so we see that in antiquity, there was once a time when the entire wealth and resources of the nation were exhausted in the service of the ruler, and yet he found them insufficient. There was but one reason for this. The stream of circumstances flowed so violently at that time that it made such a situation inevitable. Surely there is nothing strange about this. His statement that these hardships were inevitable seems sarcastic, and it's very possible to interpret this criticism of the first emperor as implicating Wu Di as well. In fact, it's sometimes been suggested that Sima Chen may have exaggerated both the negative aspects of the first emperor and the positive state of the hand prior to Wu Di, in order to make Wu Di look that much worse. Now, Sima Chen's greatest early critic was also his direct successor, Ban Gu, who wrote the Book of Han. Ban Gu admired much about Sima's work, and indeed used it extensively in writing his own history, sometimes copying sections verbatim. Because Ban Gu was alive during the Eastern Han Dynasty, which often lightly vilified the Western Han. Seema's showing Western Han emperors in a sometimes negative light was a bit more acceptable, even if Ban may have considered Seema to have gone too far in a few places. He also celebrated Seema's methodology and style, saying, quote, He discourses without sounding wordy. He is simple without being rustic. His writing is direct and fact sound. He does not falsify what is beautiful, nor does he conceal what is evil. Therefore, his may be termed a true record. However, Ban also had some complaints to make, especially in regards to how Seema engaged with the classical tradition and philosophy. He accused Seema of being, quote, careless and sketchy, and taking, quote, improper liberties with his sources, when he was working from the classics in their commentaries. More interestingly, he disliked some of the moral implications he interpreted from the records. He said, quote, his judgments often stray from those of the sage, Confucius. In discussing a fundamental moral law, he venerates the teachings of the Yellow Emperor and Lao Zi, and slice the six classics. In his introduction to the memoirs of the Wandering Knights, he disparages gentlemen scholars who live in retirement and speaks in favour of heroic scoundrels. In his narration on merchandise and prices, he honours those who are skilled at making a profit and heaps shame on those in poverty and low station. It is these points which mar his work. While I don't think it's quite, right, quite fair to say that Seema denigrated the retired Confucian scholars, it's true that he acknowledged the virtue and skill involved in careers that were thoroughly disapproved of by Confucian Puritans. Though clarifying that they weren't paragons of righteousness, he praised mob bosses and such for, the loyalty, for their loyalty to those under their protection, 
and he was able to look past the scholastic class's traditional disdain of wealthy merchants and admire the skill and wits it took to become rich through smart business. So, we have Seema Xiangru and Seema Chen, two figures who had a huge impact on Chinese cultural development, who were in some ways in tune with and in some ways divergent from the ascendant Confucianism that was the main intellectual event of their age. Now, let's talk a bit more about the religious developments of Wu Di's reign, including the Feng and Shan sacrifices and calendar reform that Sima Chan was so con- had been so concerned with. Before delving in, though, I want to preface this topic with a disclaimer. Out of all the things I've read about in preparing to make this podcast, Chinese religion is the thing I least understand. Unlike something like Greek mythology, where you've got a fairly set cosmogony and a central story of the Olympians overthrowing the Titans, there doesn't seem to be much of an overarching narrative to Chinese mythology. And it makes sense that there isn't. It's a really big country, and every little community had its own religious practices going on. For the several hundred years prior to the Qin unification, the general cultural trend of China had been towards fragmentation, as the old Zhou feudatories attempted to stake out an identity of their own. It makes sense that a clear unifying structure hadn't organically developed by the imperial period, and this lack of structure is a huge obstacle to an outsider like myself trying to comprehend the various myths. Furthermore, a lot of the gods and deities seem vaguely defined, and it's not always clear what they meant to the people who worshipped them. Some are connected with a particular local feature, such as a mountain or a river, some with a more general idea, such as with one of the elements or immortality, some seem like they're more philosophical concepts than religious deities, and then they're the ones that straddle several layers of meaning. So, I'm going to mostly focus on the historical basics. What did Woody do in regards to religion, and what were the political implications? And I humbly beg for understanding that I am likely to make some huge error when I talk about the symbolic and religious context. The other thing to keep in mind is what is that what I'm talking about here are just the official religious practices of the emperor and the state, the specific rituals in that were sponsored by the government. Popular religion is basically a separate topic that I won't be getting into. Woody was probably more interested in religious practices than any of the previous Han emperors. Since the reign of Gaozu, apart from ancestor worship, the main religious ceremony was the sacrifice to the 5D, deities representing the five elemental powers. It was usually performed at Yong, some distance west of the capital. The Han had inherited the practice from the Qin, and Gaozu had made the addition of the fifth black D to the four that the Qin had worshipped. The recognition of all five powers was meant to communicate that it was ultimately Han that had unified China. But while Gaozu made this change to the right, he never actually attended the regular ceremony. In fact, it was not until 165, Wendy's reign, that an emperor personally performed the sacrifice to the 5D. Due to some divine omens, Wendy thought that the time might be right to reform the calendar, thus recognising that a new phase was in ascendance. In the lead-up to making the changes, he performed the sacrifice to the D himself, and wore red, which was associated with the power of fire and suggests that he thought this would be the power to overcome the black water phase that had begun with the Qin dynasty. However, a year or so later, it was revealed that some of the omens had been faked by a man named Xin Yuan Ping. Xin Yuan and his family were executed, and Wendy decided that the time was not yet right to mark a new phase. During Jing Di's reign, the usual sacrifices were carried out by the officials responsible for them, but it seems that the emperor did not participate in any himself. However, once Wu Di got to the throne, things changed. Not only did Wu Di actively participate in the existing ceremonies, but he added several new ones. He first performed the sacrifice to the 5D at Yong in 133, and from then performed irregularly every few years. Of the new cults that were introduced, the two most important were to Tai Yi, the Grand Unity, and Hu Tu, Empress Earth. In addition to these regular cults, he often worshipped local religious sites if he happened to be travelling in the area. The emperor first established an altar for Empress Earth in 113, in Fen Yin, in the Hedon commandery east of the capital. The grand historian, Seema Tan, advised that the emperor honour the colour yellow during the performance, which was the colour associated in the five-phase theory with the element of Earth. It seems to me that the emperor's performance of this sacrifice may have been a way of preparing for the declaration of a new phase that had long been awaited. When he did finally reform the calendar and declare a new phase, 
It was the power of Earth that was considered in ascendance. The Grand Unity was originally a deity from the pre-imperial state of Chu. In the philosophical texts the Zhuangzi and the Huainanzi, it was described as the embodiment of existence before differentiation by the forces of yin and yang. It was also considered a sky god, and prayers to it were usually aimed to assure victory in battle. Wudi first set up a cult for it around 123, at the advice of a mystic from the eastern coast named Myoji. Byo described the deity as something like a single high culmination of the 5D, and claims that it had been worshipped by the rulers of ancient times. The cult was established just southeast of Chang'an. However, Wudi himself did not perform the ritual until late 113, when a new centre of worship was created for it at Ganchuan, the Sweet Springs Palace, to the northwest of Chang'an. It was probably done to complement the establishment of the cult of Empress Earth earlier that year, with a god representing heaven. The offerings included thick wine, jujubes, dried meat, and a sacrificed yak. During the ceremony, the emperor wore yellow, like he had done for Empress Earth. Including this first performance of 113, Wudi participated in the ritual at Ganchuan at least ten times, as well as worshipping the Grand Unity at other places on a few occasions. Notably, in the autumn of 112, in preparation for the campaign against Nanyue, prayers were addressed to the Unity, and a spear with a banner attached was made, representing the spear of the Grand Unity. In this rite, it was the role of the Grand Historian, Sima Ten, to take this spirit banner and point it in the direction of Nanyue. The most important religious ceremonies that Wudi undertook, though, were the Feng and Shan sacrifices. The Feng and Shan sacrifices were an interesting thing. During the Warring States era, it had become a common belief that they had been performed by the great rulers of the past who had brought peace to China. However, there's no decisive evidence to suggest that they had actually been performed in the past, and the details of the ceremony were unknown. The Confucian Analects contained a passage which may have been referring to them. Quote, Someone asked the meaning of the great sacrifice. The master said, I do not know. He who knew its meaning would find it as easy to govern the kingdom as to look on this, pointing at his palm. So, we can see, they were associated with sovereignty and were something of a mystery. The first historically substantiated instance of them being performed was when the first emperor did them in 219 to stake his claim of sovereignty over all China. Though he had consulted with classicists to try and figure out how the ceremony had gone in ancient times, ultimately, he and his ministers made the details up because the classicists couldn't reach a consensus. From the beginning of Wudi's reign, members of the court were expecting the emperor to perform them at some point. After all, it had been nearly 70 years since the founding of the Han, and things were looking fairly stable. Surely the time had come when the dynasty could confidently claim its right to rule by performing the Feng and Shan. A number of omens had suggested that things were in good standing with the heavenly powers, especially the discovery of an unusually large tripod cauldron in the summer of 113 at Fen Yin. Examination at the time indicated that it was genuine, however commentators after Wudi's reign have suspected that it had in fact been buried there by Sin Yuan Ping during the reign of Wen Di, so that Sin Yuan could discover it and win favour with the emperor. After the discovery of the cauldron, Wudi put his ministers and Confucian scholars to work, to figure out what the ceremony ought to be. However, again they couldn't really figure out what the practices of the past had been. It was eventually decided that it should involve shooting a bull with an arrow. Finally, after a lot of preparation and a journey to the east, on the day Yi Mao of the fourth month of the first year of Yuan Feng, the 14th of May, 110 BC, Wudi ascended the holy mountain Tai in the Shandong Peninsula, and performed the Feng sacrifice. The following day, he performed the Shan at the nearby Mount Suran. Much of the Feng ceremony was lifted from the ceremony used in worshipping the Grand Unity, and the Shan was lifted from that for Empress Earth. He wore yellow for the Feng and Shan, as he had done for those rituals. The occasion was celebrated by gifts to the common people, and ox and ten pickles of wine were granted for every hundred households, as well as two bolts of silk for those aged over eighty, and for orphans and widows. A general amnesty from criminal charges was declared, and several nearby counties were exempted from their annual corvée labour for the year. He performed the Feng sacrifice at Mount Tai again, in 106. Along with the preparation for the Feng and Shan sacrifices, Wudi had put the scholars to work to plan for changing the calendar to recognise a new phase. 
The reform was finally effected in the summer of 104. A bunch of changes were made to acknowledge the new ascendant power, Earth. Yellow was taken to be the official colour, and the titles of all the officials were changed so that they contained five characters, because five was the corollary number. As we mentioned last episode, in Wu Di's reign, years began to be grouped together in year eras, which usually contained four or six years. The system was introduced now, in 104, with previous years of Wu Di's reign being retroactively grouped together, and a new era being declared. The new era was named Tai Chu, meaning Grand Beginning. Now if we recap how the Chinese calendar worked, there were 12 months in a standard year, named first month, second month, etc. The first three months were for spring, the next three for summer, and so on. However, the date taken for the official new year could be changed. Since the Qin Dynasty, the new year had started with the 10th month, the first month of winter, because winter was the season that correlated with the power of water. With Wu Di's calendar reform, the new year was now taken to begin at the first month, the beginning of spring. Now, you might have been wondering, if there were five elemental powers and only four seasons, then there must be one power that was the odd one out and didn't have a season. And in fact, this seasonless power was Earth, the one that had been chosen as the new phase. However, it was linked to something called the intercalary month, which was like a leap month that was counted every second year to keep the calendar in line with the seasons. Of course, you couldn't count a new year from a month that only appeared every second year, so that's why the first one, even though it wasn't a correlate, was chosen. There were also other reforms to the calendar to make it more accurate, but we needn't go into that sort of detail. What's important for us is the symbolic and political message. According to historian Michael Lowe, the reform of the calendar and the other symbolic changes, quote, displayed the dynasty's conscious faith in its own strength and authority. Now, something that's interesting about the imperial cults in the early Western Han period is that the important religious sites were scattered throughout the empire, but Chang'an proper was not home to any of the regular major cults. Ganshuan, where the cult for the Grand Unity was established, was northwest of Chang'an, within eyesight. However, Yong, where the sacrifice for the 5D was carried out, and Fenyin, where the cult of Empress Earth were, was, were both more than 100 kilometers away. Mount Tai, where the Feng sacrifice was performed, was all the way on the other side of the country, about 900 kilometres away. Because of these places, and various other holy sites being scattered about, whenever Wu Di was going to perform a religious ritual, it usually involved travelling at least some distance. The religious tours ended up serving political and even military purposes as well. In 109, a year after Wu Di first performed the Feng at Mount Tai, he ordered the construction of something called the Ming Tang, which is usually translated as Bright Hole or Devotional Hole, to be built at the mountain. This was a sort of building supposedly used in ancient times by rulers for worshipping heaven. The Confucians had a plan for a Bright Hole which supposedly imitated the structure used by the early Zhou dynasty. However, Wu Di's Bright Hole at Mount Tai ended up being modelled on a design which was thought to have been used by the legendary Yellow Emperor. He used it for some religious ceremonies, worshipping the 5D and the Grand Unity. However, it was also used for secular purposes. Wu Di sometimes held his court there, and received the annual reports from the vassal kings and governors of commanderies. As for Yong, where the regular sacrifice to the 5D was held, to the west of that lay the ruins of an old Qin palace called Hui Zhong, or returning to the centre. It had been destroyed by the Xiongnu in the invasion of 167 during Wendy's reign. It had held strategic importance as a palace that lay beyond the western end of the Great Wall, and as such was often in the path of the Xiongnu invasions from the west. Wu Di often travelled there after performing the sacrifices at Yong, and had it rebuilt in 107. His visits involved inspections of the defences in the area, or of the various missions and campaigns that were going to the western regions. Aside from these specific spots, Wu Di would visit holy mountains and rivers, partly to perform religious ceremonies, but also to inspect the state of government in those areas. In fact, on one occasion, holy sites were used as a justification for the expansion of imperial power. In 122 BC, the king of Jibei voluntarily offered the emperor a portion of his territory which contained Mount Tai, because the king anticipated that Wudi would perform the Feng and Shan sacrifices there at some point. 
In 114, the kingdom of Changshan was abolished, partly because of the king's bad behaviour, but also to put another holy mountain, Heng, under direct imperial control. Aside from these political purposes, though, there was a more personal reason behind Wu Di's interest in religious practices, his desire for immortality. Like the first emperor of Qin, he was always on the lookout for things that might extend his lifespan. Men came to his court with promises that they knew a path to eternal life, especially so-called magicians from the East Coast, and some of these paths involve religious practices. Around 133 BC, a man named Li Xiaojun, who claimed to have achieved the secret of long life, advised Wu Di that he could meet spirits who could instruct him on how to become immortal if he undertook certain tasks, including performing the Feng and Shan sacrifices and visiting the legendary island of Peng Lai, which was supposed to lie to the east of the Shandong Peninsula and be home to immortals. When Li Xiaojun died of illness, the emperor believed that he had actually transformed himself into a spirit. The word spread that the emperor was in the market for magicians, and some of those who answered the call may have been the initiators behind some of the cults the emperor set up. One of them, a man named Mio Ji, first suggested worshipping the Grant Unity, and he was put in charge of the ceremonies when the first site was set up in the southeastern suburbs of Chang'an, around 123 BC. Another, Gong Sun Qing, gave Wu Di the idea that by performing the Feng sacrifice, he might be able to commune with the mythical Yellow Emperor and thereby learn the secrets of immortality. Many, many others suggested more minor things. Sima Chen gives a description of one of these men, which may serve as a general portrait for the sort of person we're talking about here. Quote, Luan Da was tall and handsome and full of magical schemes and stratagems. He did not hesitate to come out with the most grandiose pronouncements and never betrayed any sign that he doubted the truth of what he was saying. Coming to the emperor with these sorts of magic tricks and promises of long life could be very rewarding, but also very risky. One man, Xiao Wang, achieved some influence by seemingly conjuring an apparition of one of Wu Di's favourite concubines, Wang, who had died young, while the emperor watched from within a curtained room. Xiao Wang then suggested some renovations to the Gan Chuan Palace, and that the emperor ride in certain carriages on certain days, in order to properly honour the 5D, so that he might encounter spirits. But a year or so went by, and Xiao Wang wasn't able to produce any more supernatural phenomena, so he became worried that he would fall out of favour. Then, he brought an ox before Wu Di, and claimed that there was something unusual inside the ox's stomach. The animal was killed and cut open to investigate, and behold, as Xiao Wang had said, there was a piece of silk in its stomach, with some strange words written on it. Surely this proved Xiao Wang's ability. However, when the writing was more closely examined, it bore a strange resemblance to Xiao Wang's own handwriting. Of course, Xiao Wang had simply forced the ox to swallow the silk before bringing it to Wu Di. As punishment for this trick, Xiao Wang was secretly executed. Another man to rise high through his magical schemes, only to have his career cut short, was Luan Da. He impressed the emperor by making pieces on a chessboard appear to move by themselves, and he proceeded to perform sacrifices in the hopes of summoning spirits who could shine a light on the path to immortality. He was rewarded with some grand titles, granted a marquisate, and during the ceremony for the bestowal of one particular title, he was even allowed to wear clothes made of feathers, which indicated that he was not a subject of the emperor. He went on a journey to the east, saying that he would try and summon his mentor, who had taught him about immortality. However, Wudi sent some men to secretly trail him, and after some time they reported that Luan Da had had no success in summoning his mentor or any spirits. Wudi therefore had Luan Da executed. The stories of Wudi's attempts to achieve immortality are fairly numerous, and it would be pedantic to go on recounting them all. I find it fairly interesting that he shared this aspect of his personality with the first emperor, along with similarities in their policies. I wonder if the two emperors' attempts to conquer time, in a way, were linked to their successes in expanding their spatial domains. Their rapid conquests must have been somewhat dizzying for both. Qin Shi Huang went from king of one state among several to conquering all his opponents and becoming emperor of the civilized world. Wu Di went from that position, emperor of the civilized world, to defeating China's greatest enemy and establishing his rule over previously unexplored lands. It doesn't seem unlikely that both would begin to think that they might be able to win some sort of victory over time itself. Interestingly, one group of people whom Wudi seems to have ignored a bit when it came to religious advice was the Confucianists. As we saw earlier, 
although he consulted with classical scholars on what, on what ceremonies to perform at the Feng sacrifice. The scholars couldn't come to a consensus. They insisted on studying the odes, the documents, and a few other select ancient texts to try and figure out how the ritual had been carried out in the past. They ended up agreeing that, invo- that it involved shooting a bull with an arrow, but when Wu Di showed them the ritual vessels that had been made for the ceremony, they objected that the vessels did not match what had been used in antiquity, though it seems they could not provide an adequate alternative. In the end, Wu Di decided to stop listening to them in regards to the ritual because of their unhelpfulness. Another thing I briefly mentioned was the Bing Tang, the Bright Hole. The classical scholars seem to have had a general consensus about what the Bright Hole should be. They thought it should be near the capital, and modelled on the structure supposedly used by the Zhuo court. However, Wudi followed the advice of some guy called Gong Sun Dai, who was perhaps another of these magician types, and built his bright hole far away from Chang'an at Mount Tai, and modelled it on the one supposedly used by the Yellow Emperor. Uh, another Confucian suggestion, which Wudi ignored, was an idea by Dong Zhongshu himself. Dong proposed starting a cult at Tian, or Heaven, to supplant the worship of the 5D and the Grand Unity. Dong and other classicists associated the worship of Heaven with the Zhou dynasty, which had claimed its right to rule through the Mandate of Heaven. Confucians may have felt distasteful the worship of the D and the Grand Unity, which, remember, was considered some sort of unity of the D, since the D had been inherited from Qin, which the Confucians considered their historical archenemy. Whatever the reasons behind the idea, though, Wudi didn't take it up. The proposal did resurface later in the Han Dynasty, and was met with a bit more success. We'll get to that when we get to it, though. Another religious disagreement Wudi had with Dong Zhong Shu was over whether political decisions could disrupt the cosmic balance, resulting in disasters or, un- or unusual occurrences. In 135, the temple to Gao Zhu in the Liaodong Commandery burnt down. After this, Dong Zhong Shu wrote a work called Records of Disasters and Portents, which explained the tragedy by looking at current policy. But Wu Di was angered by the work, and he arrested Dong. Luckily for Dong, he was pardoned before he could be executed, but thenceforth, he didn't speak about disasters and portents anymore. The final majorly culturally significant thing I'd like to mention is Wu Di's construction of palaces and the development of the capital, Chang'an. From its founding by Liu Bang, Chang'an had always been a city dominated by palaces. Gaozu had built the Changul Palace on top of an old Qin Palace, and west of that built the Wei Yang, located on top of a terraced hill, the most prominent feature in the skyline and a display of the dynasty's grandeur. Both of these palace complexes were bold, as were most of the later additions to the city, including markets and residential wards. These walls were generally made of tamped earth, some and some were as tall as 7 metres, making for a guarded, claustrophobic city of walls within walls. Between the Weiyang and Changul palaces lay the arsenal, which consisted of several warehouses containing a huge number of neatly organised weapons and arms, both of practical use in case an army needed to be mobilised around the capital, and a visual signifier of military strength. North of these two palaces, and the arsenal, was another palace, suitably enough called the Bay, or Northern Palace. A market developed north of the Bay Palace, as the north of the city was, pla- was best placed to access the Wei River, the key transport artery for the Guanzhong Basin. Hui Di made a few important additions to the capital, including an external wall, roughly square in shape and more than 25 kilometres long, about 12 metres high and between 12 and 16 metres thick, and with a moat dug around the outside as well. He made a temple to Gao Zhu, south of the Changul Palace, which ended up being the only major religious site within the city walls. He also built a new market, the Western Market, next to the original market, afterwards known as the Eastern Market. Each market was walled and divided into nine interior sections, with stalls grouped together according to what sort of groups they sold. The new Western Market also had facilities for manufacture, such as a kiln and an iron casting site. Within each market, there was a five-story tower, standing tall above everything else, where the state-appointed market chief and his officials could keep their eye on the various goings-on. Several main thoroughfares cut through the city, each with three lanes, with the centre lane reserved for imperial carriages. These thoroughfares were crossed overhead by elevated and covered walkways linking the palace complexes, allowing the emperor to move from one palace to another undetected. In the gaps between the thoroughfares, 
there were large blocks of residential wards. A single ward was a narrow and rectangular walled space, with a road running through the middle of its length, dividing it into two rows of houses on the left and right. Some wards may have had as many as 50 or even 100 households, while it's plausible that in others, some wealthy family may have had the entire ward to themselves. The wards housing wealthier people were closer to the main thoroughfares, while those of the poor lay in the middle of the dense blocks. One eastern hand text puts the number of wards within the city walls at 160. Altogether, there may have been over a million people living within the city walls. Of course, the metropolitan area ended up growing beyond the outer wall that Huede had built. The area administered by as the Chang'an County consisted of just the walled city and the suburbs immediately surrounding it. A total of 57 counties fell under the administration of the Metropolitan Superintendent, who was a member of the central government, though in effect his duties were that of the governor of a commandery. In 135, to account for population growth, the jurisdiction of the Metropolitan Superintendent was split in two, and there were now officials for a Metropolitan super- Superintendent of the left, west, and the right, east. In 104, the western capital region was further divided, and a third office called Governor of the Capital was created. Within these divisions, there were some other particularly notable counties, namely those that contained the funerary mounds of past emperors, which were mostly on the northern side of the Wei River, opposite Chang'an proper. During Wu Di's reign, there were four of these sites. Gaozu and Empress Liu were buried at Changling, Huidi at Anling, Jingdi at Yangling, and the odd one out, Wendi at Baling, which was east of the city and on the other side of the Ba River. These burial sites weren't silent places of reflection either. They were towns of themselves, with whole populations employed in maintaining the mausoleum and performing rites for the deceased ruler. Toward the end of the dynasty, some of these towns may have been home to even more people than Chang'an itself. The mounds themselves rose so high that they were like an artificial mountain range on the horizon. Aside from an additional funeral site, each time an emperor died though, there weren't actually many major additions to Chang'an between the reigns of Hui Di and Wu Di. With Hui Di's wall, the city was secure enough, and I guess they didn't want to put so much energy and resources into construction projects, while the empire as a whole was not yet fully stable. In addition, Wen Di probably would have considered such works to be an unnecessary burden for the common people, whose lot it would have been to carry them out. However, it should be no surprise that Wu Di, as he did in so many other spheres, enacted major transformations on the capital. Just within Chang'an walls, Wu Di added two whole new palaces. The smaller, the Gui, meaning Cassia, was built to the west of the Bei Palace. The larger, the Ming Guang, or Brilliant, was built in 102, and took up an immense space north of the Changul Palace. The construction of these two palaces took up a lot of space, and would have pushed many people out into the exterior suburbs. Some estimates say that after this point, just a third of the land within the city walls was available for residential wards. Eventually, the different palaces within the city became the living quarters of different members of the imperial family. The Weiyang served as the main residence of the emperor, and was the main centre for government work. The Mingguang and the Changlu were predominantly for the empress dowager, with the latter also being a political hub. The Bei was for the heir apparent, and the Gui for imperial consorts. Despite the new palaces he built in the city, Wudi actually spent much of his time outside of the capital, visiting and hosting his court at several places across the empire, especially the Ganchuan Palace, where the sacrifice to the Grand Unity was held. His most impressive project lay just beyond Chang'an's walls, southwest of the city. This project was the renovation of the Shanglin Park, and the construction of the massive Jianjiang Palace within the park. If you remember, the Shanglin had been a hunting ground of the Qin Dynasty, and the first emperor had built his own massive palace there, and filled the park with all sorts of exotic things. Shanglin had been neglected since the fall of the Qin, but Wudi determined to renovate it, and bring it to an entirely new level of glory. The park was filled with statues representing stars in the heavens, and with plants and animals from the furthest reaches of his empire. A huge artificial lake was dug out, which could host mock naval battles, the description of the park forms a lengthy section of Simus Yangru's poem, which he wrote for the emperor. While, as we saw before, the poem goes into the realms of fantasy to communicate just how wondrous the park was, even the more believable parts sound amazing. I'll recite just one part of it. Quote, 
gazing upon the expanse of the park, at the abundance and variety of its creatures, one's eyes are dizzied and enraptured, by the boundless horizons, the borderless vistas. The sun rises from the eastern ponds, and sets among the slopes of the west. In the southern part of the park, where grasses grow in the dead of winter, and the waters leap, unbound by ice. Live zebras, yaks, tapirs, black oxen, water buffalo, elk and antelope, red crowns and roundheads, oryx, elephants and rhinoceroses. In the north, where in the midst of summer, the ground is cracked and blotched with ice, and one may walk the frozen streams or wade rivulets, roam unicorns and boars, wild asses and camels, onagers and mares, swift stallions, donkeys and mules. Here the country palaces and imperial retreats cover the hills and span the valleys, verandas surrounding their four sides, with storied chambers and winding porticos, painted rafters and jade-studded corbels, interlacing paths for the royal palanquin, and arcaded walks stretching such distances that their length cannot be traversed in a single day. Here the peaks have been levelled for mountain holes, terraces raised, story upon story, and chambers built in the deep grottoes, peering down into the caves one cannot spy their end, gazing up at the rafters, one seems to see them brush the heavens. As you can see from the description of different extremes of, of different extreme climates of the north and south, with their respective wildlife, the park was in some way meant to be a microcosm of Woody's vast domain. I mentioned last episode that Woody was inspired to build the Jianjiang after a tower in the Shanglin Park called the Boliang Terrace burned down in 104. Apparently, a man named Yong Zhe from Yue informed the emperor that it was the custom of his people to replace burnt buildings with grander ones. I'm sure this bigger is better attitude appealed to a man like Wu Di, so he began construction of the Jianjiang Palace, that is, palace for establishing statutes, in the Shanglin Park, in the corner that was closest to Chang'an, but still on the opposite side of the Jue River. This is the description we get of it in the records. Quote, it had countless numbers of gates and doors, and the front hall was larger than that of the Eternal Palace, Weiyang Palace. On the east side was the Phoenix Tower, measuring over 20 zhang in height, about 46 metres. On the west were the walks, with a garden measuring about 20 or 30 li, in which tigers were kept, 8 or 12 kilometres. North of the palace was built a large lake called the Great Fluid, with the terrace of lapping water rising over 20 zhang from it. In the middle of the lake were Peng Lai, Fang Zhang, Ying Zhuo, and Hui Lang, or and Hui Liang, islands built to represent the spirit isles of the sea, or such things as turtles and fish. On the south were the Jeweled Hole, the Jade Gate, the Great Bird, and similar constructions, as well as the Terrace of the Spirits and the Railing Tower, measuring 50 Zhang, 115 metres, all connected by walks for the Imperial Palanquin. There was also an elevated walkway built, which spanned all the way from the Jianjiang Palace, over the river, over the walls of Chang'an, to the Weiyang Palace. Those islands built in the lake, the Peng Lai and the others, were imitations of the legendary islands on the eastern coast, which were supposed to be inhabited by immortals. It was simultaneously a hugely self-indulgent endeavour, allowing Wu Di to live in absurdly extreme luxury and dream of expanding his lifespan, as well as an awesome display of imperial glory showing off the vastness of the empire and communicating in architecture the emperor's connection to the cosmos. Woody ended up spending much of his time during the later part of his reign at Shanglin Park, and it became the centre of much of the work of government, so that it ended up rivalling the capital itself for how important it was politically. As a sign of how much it was a seat of administration in addition to a personal retreat, in 113, when a government monopoly was established for minting coins, the three new officers responsible for minting were located in Shanglin Park. And this leads us, neatly enough, to a discussion of economic policy under Wu Di. And here we get to see a whole other side of Wu Di's government. We've talked about the cultural developments, most important of which was the elevation of classically trained scholars. 
But most of the important statesmen of Wudi's reign were not the sort of people to dream about restoring China to the cultivated virtues of an ideal past. They were practical men who were focused on streamlining the instruments of government to best serve the empire's needs. The main economic question facing statesmen during Wudi's reign was how to finance all those military campaigns we were talking about last episode, as well as other costly projects, like all those palaces, roads to newly conquered territories, and repair projects to the banks of the Yellow River after major floods. Remember the rich and happy empire that Wudi inherited? Well, according to Seema, by 124, when the fourth expedition into Xiongnu territory was launched, the Ministry of Agriculture was broke. Of course, both the prosperity at the beginning of Wudi's reign and the deprivation of the Ministry of Agriculture in 124 could be exaggerated, but even so, it suggests that these campaigns and other projects were taking their toll on the state coffers. Another secondary problem which often came up in economic discussions was the rise of wealthy merchants. There were a few concerns about wealthy merchants, which mostly stemmed from the fact that they formed an elite that was outside the official state hierarchy. They were seen as a political threat, potential allies to dissident kings and exploiters of the poor. In addition, because of the common belief in government that agriculture was the root of the country's wealth, there was a fear about what would happen if too many people were engaged in trading rather than farming. And, in my amateur opinion, this may have been a legitimate fear. Even if we're talking about a prosperous society relative to other ancient societies, this was still a society where a community could be, a, could be one bad harvest or a natural disaster away from starvation. And unlike today, where in developed countries a very small number of people can produce enough food for everyone, back then the easiest way to increase agricultural production was to have more people working on the farms. More cynically, it was much easier to tax a farmer whose wealth was entirely in his land and crop than a merchant whose wealth was in movable goods. This was not a new problem, and in fact one of the most famous depictions of the situation comes from Chao Tsua, the minister who was behind Jingde's measures to reduce the kingdoms. During the reign of Wendy, he made this devastating report, quote, Nowadays in a farming family of five members, at least two of them are required to render labour service. The area of their arable land is no more than 100 mu, 11.3 acres. The yield from which does not exceed 100 shi, about 2,000 litres. Farmers plough in spring, weed in summer, reap in autumn, and store in winter. They cut undergrowth and wood for fuel, and render labour services to the government. They cannot avoid wind and dust in spring, sultry heat in summer, dampness and rain in autumn, and cold and ice in winter. Thus, all year round, they cannot afford to take even a day's rest. Furthermore, they have to welcome guests on their arrival and see them off on their departure. They have to mourn for the dead and inquire after the sick. Besides, they have to bring up infants. Although they work as hard as this, they still have to bear the calamities of flood and drought. Sometimes taxes are collected unexpectedly. If the orders are issued in the morning, they must be prepared to pay by the evening. To meet this demand, farmers have to sell their possessions at half price, and those who are destitute have to borrow money at 200% increases. Eventually, they have to sell fields and dwellings, or sometimes sell even children and grandchildren into slavery in order to pay back the loan. On the other hand, great merchants get profits of 200% by hoarding stocks of commodities, while the lesser ones sit in rows in the market stalls to buy and sell. They deal in superfluous luxuries and lead an easy life in the cities. Taking advantage of the urgent demands of the government, they sell commodities at a double price. Though they never engage in farming, and their women neither tend silkworms nor weave, they always wear embroidered and multicoloured clothes and always eat fine millet and meat. Without experiencing the farmer's sufferings, they make vast gains. Taking advantage of their riches, they associate with kings and marquises. Their power exceeds that of the official, and they try to surpass each other in using their profits. They wander idly around, roaming as far as a thousand li. There are so many of them that they form long lines on the roads. They ride in well-built carriages and whip up fat horses, wear shoes of silk and trail white silk garments. It is no wonder that merchants take over farmers, and farmers become vagrants, drifting from one place to another. So given this situation, another economic goal was to somehow deal with these wealthy merchants and block up the avenues whereby they made their money. One approach to improving the empire's financial outlook was to improve agricultural productivity. This was mostly done through the construction of irrigation canals in several regions, 
which improved existing farmland and made boreland cultivatable. Beginning in 132, several major irrigation projects are recorded in the standard histories. Historian Jun Shu Zhang estimates that in total, between 230 and 340,000 men worked on the projects, and the new canals would have watered 1.25 million acres of land. This newly irrigated land alone could have produced as much as 1.8 billion litres of grain annually, an enormous increase if that's what happened. The upfront cost of these projects was high, and sometimes they didn't even work out. Construction of a canal system in the Heidong Commandery had to be abandoned after the Yellow River changed its course, rendering the new canals ineffective. However, when they worked, it clearly paid back enormous dividends in to invest in them. Canals were also built to connect different rivers and shorten transportation routes from the Guangdong region to Chang'an, meaning that the cost of transporting grain from the eastern side of the country to the capital was reduced. Another innovation which increased agricultural productivity was a new method of sowing fields, called the alternating field system. It involved digging furrows to bury seeds and filling them in, which meant the seeds were planted deeper and were more protected from wind and drought. It utilised the new ox-drawn plough, which meant that more land could be ploughed with the same amount of human labour. This method was attributed to a man named Xiao Guo, the grain intendant, though historian Nishijima Sedao says it was most likely the idea of another man called Sang Hong Yang, a statesman who will meet in a little bit. Cool as this method was though, it was not developed until the last years of Wudi's reign, so it didn't play a huge role in funding his campaigns. Aside from increasing productivity, several more measures were taken to raise funds in the short term. One method was allowing the sales of ranks of honour. I haven't talked about these ranks too much, but I gave them a brief rundown in the episode on Gaudi. Under the Han, there were 20 of these ranks, which conferred social status and some material privileges. Each progressively higher rank entitled the holder to better privileges. The first eight places in the hierarchy could be achieved when the emperor bestowed general increases of rank, which could apply to a local population, or even to every head of household in the empire. Such bestowals were often made to celebrate such things as the accession of a new emperor, the nomination of an empress, or as a sort of relief following a natural disaster. These sorts of general proclamations, though, could not raise one beyond the position of 8th rank. The ninth rank on upwards was only, were only granted on an individual basis. In the past, there had been some instances where it had been possible to purchase some of the lower ranks of the system. In order to raise funds, Woody put more ranks on the market, including the 9th and 10th ranks, which previously had only been available as a special award, rather than through general bestowals. He also widened the scope of ranks which were considered high. Under Gaudi, all the ranks from the 7th and above had been considered high, entitling the holder to exemptions from the poll tax, military and labour service, and even entitling them to the income of a particular estate. Under later rulers, though, the category of high rank had been restricted as part of the efforts to centralise power. High ranks carried some sort of political rights, such as giving someone the opportunity to work in government. Hui Di had restricted the high ranks to the ninth and above, as had been the case in Qin, and under Wendi or Jingdi, this had been increased to the tenth and above. However, Wu Di brought the high ranks back down to the 9th and later to the 8th. This was probably to make the ranks that were for sale more desirable. In addition, in 123, a whole new ranking system was introduced alongside the old system. These were called ranks of military merit, and as the name suggests, they were ostensibly created to reward military achievement. However, the real purpose was to raise funds. Every position in the 11 rank scale was available for purchase. The new ranks of military merit were a pathway to official positions, and there were similar privileges attached to them as what you could get from advancing up the old system. This ended up causing some problems in the long run, as so many people bought ranks which exempted them from labour or military service that the government started to run short on the free labour it was usually entitled to call upon. In some instances, excuses were cooked up to punish people en masse, and they were forced to work on some project or other. In addition to this more formal system of buying social rank, there were a few occasions where Woody simply opened up certain lowish level official positions for sale. One interesting instance of this was when a number of arrests were made during a gambling ring busting operation. Those arrested could buy a pardon if they had the cash, and could even get a job as a palace attendant. 
Around 120 BC, a group of statesmen were enlisted by Wu Di to come up with some innovative policies to help raise funds for his military campaigns. The most important of these was Sang Hongyang. Sang was the son of a merchant, and from a young age, he had displayed exceptional mathematical skills. Because of his abilities, he was made a palace attendant at the age of 12, in 140. Now in his early 30s, Sang was also joined by two men who had made their names in the iron and salt industries, two of the most lucrative manufacturers in China. These were Dong Guo Xianyang and Kong Jin. Although initially, Sang acted as an assistant to, Kong, to Dong Guo and Kong, he is often credited as the brains behind some of their ideas, and eventually he eclipsed them career-wise. Sima Chen says of the trio, quote, When it came to a question of, make, of how to make a profit, the three of them knew their business down to the smallest detail. In 119, these men rolled out one of Han China's most famous economic policies, the salt and iron monopolies. This was like nationalising the iron and salt industries, which had so far been carried out mainly by private enterprise. In the case of iron, all the mines and production centres were put under direct government control. Labour was carried out by convicts, men serving their annual corvée, and sometimes state-owned slaves. The iron monopoly wasn't responsible only for mining, but also for making iron products, especially agricultural equipment. Eventually, government manufactured tools became the only ones available on the market. For salt production, the government hired private operators to carry out the extraction and then sold the produce itself. The main purpose of the move was, of course, so that the government could take in all the profit from the production of these two important resources. However, it also served the secondary purpose of cutting off an avenue whereby people could become very wealthy and powerful outside of the state hierarchy, and in fact, many merchants who had made their wealth in these industries prior to monopolisation ended up working for the government to help run the new monopolies. Of course, Exhibit A for such merchants was Dong Xianyang and Kong Jin, themselves having been titans of these industries before working for the government and developing the policy. Now, in Han China, there were two different organs of government in charge of economic policy. They had different responsibilities and separate streams of revenue. The largest of the two was the Ministry of Agriculture, headed by the Superintendent of Agriculture. It was like the Department for Public Expenses. It was responsible for paying the salaries of officials, financing construction projects like the irrigation canals, and for military expenses. Its main revenue came from the direct taxes on the people, the land tax, the poll tax, and the property tax, which we talked about in the episode on Wendy. It also profited from state-owned farmland. The other organ was the Lesser Treasury, or Privy Treasury, headed by the Superintendent of the Lesser Treasury. Roughly speaking, we could say that this was responsible for the private finances of the imperial court. The main things it paid for were the living expenses of those in the court, such as entertainers, courtiers, members of the harem and various specialists. Other court expenses, such as for food and clothing, it funded the lavish rewards the emperor would bestow upon his favourites and the meritorious, and could also provide grants to the Ministry of Agriculture for emergency relief in the case of a natural disaster or the like. The lesser treasury made its money in a few ways. The annual tribute of gold from the kings and marquises, and there were some special taxes, such as a tax on registered merchants and the poll tax on miners. There was also the tax on natural resources. Mountains, forests, and bodies of water were considered the property of the emperor, so their products, things like fish, timber, and metals, while they could be produced privately, were subject to a tax that went to the lesser treasury. This meant that prior to the monopolies, the tax on salt and iron operations went to the lesser treasury. However, since the purpose of creating the monopolies was to help finance the war effort, and military expenditure was the job of the Ministry of Agriculture, Wudi made the salt and iron monopolies the responsibility of that ministry. Another major economic policy of 119 was the reform of the property tax. It was a raise specifically targeted at merchants, who were already taxed at higher rates than the average person, through the poll tax and the merchant tax. Previously, the property tax had been 1 swan, 120 chan, for every 10,000 chan worth of property, a rate of 1.2%. Now the property tax rate for merchants was raised to 6%, and for manufacturers to 3%. Also, there was a new tax for vehicles, 1 swan for those owned by commoners, and 2 swan for those owned by merchants. There was also a tax of 1 swan for boats over a certain length. The penalty for trying to avoid these taxes was to have your property confiscated. 
In addition, a law was made which forbade registered merchants from owning farmland. This was probably done to discourage farmers from taking up trading jobs on the side. In this year, in addition to the increases in the property tax, the poll tax on miners was increased from 20 chian to 23. The extra 3 chian went to the Ministry of Agriculture, rather than the lesser treasury, in order to pay for the war effort. The other big economic step of 119 was the introduction of a new coin, which was the last of several experiments with different sorts of currency. The drive for a new coin was part of the effort to combat illegal minting. Although private minting had been made a crime during the reign of Jingdi, there was still an awful lot of it going on, and it was devaluing the currency. One method which was used by forgers was to file or clip off the edges of coins and use the metal to create new ones. The new coin that was introduced in 119, called the Wushu, had raised edges, which meant that it couldn't be filed or clipped without detection, and made it harder to imitate. It ended up serving as the base coin for the rest of the Han Dynasty, though at various times other coins of higher denominations were used alongside it. The introduction of the Wushu coin wasn't the end of the matter though. Minting was carried out by both the central government and by commandery governments. However, the commandery produced coins weren't quite up to scratch, and even with the raised rims were susceptible to forgery. Thus, in 113, minting was made the sole prerogative of the three Shanglin officers based in Shanglin Park, which I mentioned earlier. These officers were under the direction of a new governmental position, the Superintendent of Waterways and Parks, which came to be a third department alongside the Ministry of Agriculture and the Lesser Treasury, responsible for state finances. The final move of 113 resulted in coins of such high and consistent quality that forgery became unprofitable for all but the most sophisticated criminals. By 115, Kong Jin had reached the office of Superintendent of Agriculture, and Sang Hong Yang acted as his assistant. Together they effected an innovative new policy, establishing in the capital and various commanderies equal supply officers, which were to buy up local goods and transport them to the capital, where demand for those sorts of things was high, and sell them to private buyers. It was essentially a way to compete with merchants who did just that, with the hope of gaining a monopoly on the transporting goods to the capital business, so as to repress the merchants and channel profit to the government. The system ran into some problems though. The officials which were sent out to buy the local goods ended up competing with each other and raising prices. Also, the cost of transporting things to the capital was so bad that sometimes the process ended up being unprofitable. By 110, Kong Jin had faded out of the picture and Sang Hong Yang had become superintendent of agriculture. He made some additions to the system which were designed to counteract these problems. He decentralized the process so that more equal supply officers were established in the provinces, and the officials from those officers would have a better chance of buying up local goods when they were cheap. These were then taken to the capital and hoarded in an office called the Price Stabilization Office, which would sell them when the prices were high. From what I understand, the new system, which was called the Balanced Standard, was a more strategic approach to undercutting merchants. When the price stabilization office decided prices were high enough to start selling some particular product that it had stored up, it had the effect of lowering prices in the capital, which made private trading ventures less worthwhile. Not only did this benefit the consumer by lowering prices and avoiding sharp price rises, but it served the twin economic goals of channeling money to the government and repressing merchants. This covers most of the major economic policies of Wudi's reign, though there are a few minor ones worth mentioning. New ways for encouraging direct payments to the government were implemented. If you had been sentenced for a crime, you could pay a ransom to escape punishment. For a more positive form of encouragement, peasants who made donations of grain to the imperial granaries were rewarded with special privileges, such as lifetime exemption from military service and a guaranteed amnesty protecting, the, protecting them from accusations that could result in the confiscation of their property. And in 98, an alcohol monopoly was established, which seems to have been made in the mould of the iron monopoly, with direct government control over both production and distribution. Altogether, the work of Sang Hong Yang and the others seems to have been pretty successful. Not only were they able to support the military ventures, but they apparently returned China to some level of prosperity. Sima Chen concludes his narrative of the economic situation thusly, quote, Areas that were in need were immediately supplied by shipments of grain from other provinces, and the various officials of the Ministry of Agriculture all drew grain from east of the mountains, 
so that the amount of transport to the capital increased to 6 million pickles annually. Within a year, the granary at Tai Tsang in the capital and at Sweet Springs, Ganchuan, had been filled. The frontiers enjoyed a surplus of grain and other goods, and the transportation officers had 5 million rolls of silk. Though taxes on the people had not been increased, there was now more than enough to cover the expenditures of the empire. As for the secondary purpose of repressing merchants, it may not have been achieved to the same extent. The raised taxes and other laws discriminating against merchants did make the business less profitable. However, what ended up happening was that the wealthiest merchants bought huge tracts of land and took up the landlord career instead. Thus, the problem of powerful rich people outside of the state hierarchy persisted. This, however, was a problem for future emperors, and we'll get to it in later episodes. All these new economic policies were not without their critics. In Wudi's reign, there developed two sorts of political factions, which we call the modernists and the reformists. The modernists were the people like Sang Hong Yang who were behind these sorts of interventionist economic programs, and for the majority of Wudi's reign, it was the modernist ideas that held sway in policy development. The reformist tide did not really come until after Wudi's rule. However, even within Wudi's lifetime, opposition was raised, and the chief critic was a man named Bu Shi. Some of the arguments he brought against the policies later became standard talking points for the reformist position. Bu Shi had a humble origin, working as a sort of hermit shepherd, taking care of his flock in the mountains of Hainan Commandery, on the Yellow River. He started out with a hundred sheep, which he had inherited from his parents, but he was good at what he did, and over time he increased his flock to a thousand, and bought a house and some land for himself. His younger brother was less successful, but Bu did the virtuous thing and gave him a share of his own wealth. Around the time that the campaigns against the Xiongnu were stepping up in frequency, Bu Shi decided to travel to the capital and patriotically offered half of his wealth to the cause. Astonished, Wu Di dispatched an envoy to see what Bu was trying to get in return. Maybe he would like a government position as a reward. Bu humbly declined though, saying that he only had experience raising animals and did not know how to govern. Perhaps then, someone in Bu's family had suffered an injustice, and he was hoping the emperor might be able to intercede. Bu replied that this was not the case, and explained that he was well respected in his community. Quote, I have never in my life had a quarrel with anyone. If there are poor men in my village, I lend them what they need, and if there are men who do not behave properly, I guide and counsel them. Where I live, everyone does as I say. Why should I suffer any injustice from others? There is nothing I want to report. Wudi's envoy asks then what his motive was in making such a generous donation, and Bu's answer clues us in to his world view. Quote, the Son of Heaven has set out to punish the Xiongnu. In my humble opinion, every worthy man should be willing to fight to the death to defend the borders, and every person with wealth ought to contribute to the expense. If this were done, the Xiongnu could be wiped out. Bu Shi was all about self-sacrifice for the good of the empire, and was an example that Wu Di was eager to promote. However, when the emperor put the question of whether to accept the donation to the chancellor, Gong Sun Hong, Gong Sun said, quote, the proposal is simply not in accord with human nature. Such eccentric people are of, of no use in guiding the populace, but only throw the laws into confusion. I beg you not to accept his offer. Gong Sun himself was a notoriously wily and deceitful politician, which is perhaps why he was disparaging of Bu's altruism. Therefore, Wu Di dilly dallied, and in the end, did not accept Bu's donation. However, this did not discourage Bu from further acts of patriotism. In 120, following the surrender of the Xiongnu Hunye king the previous year, the state was sponsoring a lot of people to go and migrate to the newly conquered territories. This was an expensive process, and with all the other things going on demanding resources, money was tight. Therefore, Bu Shi gave 200,000 cash to the governor of Hainan, the official for his commandery, for use in the migration project. When the emperor later found out, he recognised the name and sent Bu Shi around 120,000 cash in return, just to see what he'd do, I guess. Bu Shi promptly turned this sum over to the governor of Hainan too. At this time, according to Sima Chen, most wealthy families were trying to hide their riches and avoid contributing anything to the war effort. Bu Shi stood out as a worthy individual, and Wudi finally decided to put him to use. He made him a magistrate of a county called Gorshi, and when he proved a good leader there, he was put on the fast track. 
he received a more important magistrate job at Changgao County, and then was made senior tutor to the heir apparent of the Kingdom of Qi. He then became Chancellor of Qi. In 112, when the campaign against Nanyue was launched, Bu Shi volunteered to go and fight with his sons. Although the emperor didn't take him up on the offer, he rewarded his fervour with a marquisate. Later that year, Bu was raised to the second highest post in the central government, that of imperial councillor. Despite Bu Shi's meteoric rise though, others were not inspired to follow his altruistic example. Cash donations to the government remained a rarity, and not a single other marquise volunteered to join the campaign in Nanyue. It seems that while Bu Shi himself was living up to his ideal, others were not inspired to. To make matters worse for Bu Shi, once he became imperial councillor, he started criticising some of the economic policies that had been put in effect. The salt and iron monopolies would result in low-quality products being sold for high prices, and in some cases people were being forced by officials to buy them. The persecution of traders, particularly through the boat tax, had in fact had negative effects. With less people carting goods around the country, decreasing local supply, prices had gone up. Bushi asked that the boat tax be repealed. However, Wu Di, always open to constructive criticism, declined and began to take a disliking to Bushi. By 110, Bushi had been demoted to senior tutor of the heir apparent. This understandably soured Bushi a bit, and he seems to have taken a particular disliking to Sang Hong Yang, at this time superintendent of agriculture and prime mover behind the modernist policies. Seema Chen reports that in 110, quote, There was a minor drought and the emperor ordered the officials to pray for rain. Bushi remarked to the emperor, The government officials are supposed to collect what taxes they need for their food and clothing, and that is all. Now Sang Hong Yang has them sitting in market stalls and buying and selling goods and scrambling for profit. If your majesty were to boil Sang Hong Yang alive, then I think heaven might send us rain. I think Bu Shi was probably joking, and Sang Hong Yang was not boiled alive. However, as we'll see next time, Bu Shi's criticism against the balanced standard system, that it had government officials essentially acting like merchants, was developed later in the debate between reformists and modernists in Zhao Di's reign. Bu Shi was not the only man opposed to modernist policies. Our old friend, Dong Zhongshu, the man behind the Confucian state ideology, made a moral argument against them saying that they increased wealth inequality. However, they remained in place until the end of Wu Di's reign, and we'll have to wait till future episodes to see what fate awaited them. The next topic we'll talk about is how the governance of China changed during Wu Di's reign. It's a bit of a hard topic to talk about, because we aren't talking so much about concrete events, but background changes in how things were done. What's generally agreed is that there was a shift in decision-making power from the outer court, the official bureaucracy headed by the Chancellor, to the inner court, members of the Emperor's entourage, especially the Secretariat, who did not necessarily hold government positions. Because what we're talking about here is a kind of background process, it's hard to point to deliberate decisions that pushed things in, the, in this direction. What we can point to is how the shift manifested itself. One thing we notice about Weedy's reign is that the Chancellorship, the highest office in the official bureaucracy, seems to have become less powerful. For one thing, chancellors tended to serve shorter terms than in the past. In the 62 years of the Han Dynasty before Wu Di, 13 men had been chancellors, six of whom had held the post for more than five years. In Wu Di's 54-year reign, 12 men were chancellors, and only three of them had the office for more than five years. What's more, the people chosen for the job tended to be less energetic men than previous chancellors, those of Wudi's chancellors who did stay in office a relatively long time tended to be rather weak-willed. Shi Qing, who served from 111 to 104, barely managed to do anything on his own initiative during his tenure. The shift from chancellors, who had made significant contributions to the empire, to ones who were more forgettable, was nicely described by Sima Chen. Quote, After the death of Shen Tu Jia, Tao Qing, the Marquis of Kaifeng, and Liu Han, the Marquis of Tao, served in turn as Chancellor during the reign of Emperor Jing, while in the reign of our present Emperor, Su Chang, the Marquis of Boruji, Sui Zhe, the Marquis of Pingji, Xuang Qingdi, Marquis of Wu Qiang, Zhao Zhao, Marquis of Gaoling, and others have been Chancellor. All were men who succeeded to their noble titles by birth, being of impeccable demeanour, 
and sterling integrity, fully qualified to fill the office of Chancellor, but that was all. None of them proved capable of making any brilliant contributions to the government, or doing anything to distinguish his name in the eyes of his contemporaries. The move towards the inner court can be seen in the influence wielded by people close to the emperor. Sang Hongyang had spent most of his career as a palace attendant, part of the inner court, and though his first position in the government bureaucracy was a junior one, he is credited with the major policies of that time, suggesting his input was disproportional to his official station. A man called Zhu Fu Yan got a job as a palace attendant, and even without an official posting, had significant input on policy. He was behind a scheme to weaken feudal states by enfeeving the sons and younger brothers of kings as marquises, granting them a piece of territory from the original kingdom, similar to Jia Yi's policy of dividing kingdoms between the sons of the king when he died. He was also responsible for another scheme of resettling, quote, wealthy and powerful families and troublemakers among the people at Morling, Wudi's planned funerary town, in order to restrain and isolate potential evildoers without punishing them. And he also urged the reconquest of the Ordos, which was eventually accomplished despite opposition from the senior ministers, including the Chancellor, Gong Sun Hong. One of the inner court positions that became very important was the Secretariat. This was the office responsible for screening proposals before they were presented to the Emperor. As such, it had the potential to be very influential, as the Secretariat could choose what information the Emperor did and did not see. Although the office was not occupied by any notable men during Wudi's reign, it's often considered to have become more powerful than previously, and immediately after he died, the man in the position became de facto the most powerful person in the empire. There are a few reasons for the shift to the inner court. While the emperor was, from the beginning of the dynasty, an absolute monarch, there were conventions of the bureaucracy which limited the exercise of power a bit. The various officers of the three excellencies and nine ministers had defined responsibilities, which sort of implied that the emperor ought to consult with whoever held a particular office before making changes in that field of responsibility. The sort of men who ascended to the top positions had usually spent their careers within that system. It was an apparatus that by its mere operation hampered the emperor's ability to arbitrarily exercise power. Doing things through the inner court circumvented the time-consuming nature of the official bureaucracy and gave an emperor more freedom to act. Homer H. Dubbs, translator of the Book of Han, offers a neat theory about how the Secretariat in particular came to be so important. According to him, Huidi was a lot more actively involved in government than previous emperors, and as such, proposals and problems were submitted directly to him, rather than going through the Chancellor or Imperial Councillor first, as had been the usual practice. But since documents to the Emperor went through the Secretariat, Huidi's personal activism had the effect of empowering that office. It's a neat explanation, though I'm not sure it's completely satisfactory. As we'll see later, some scholars have questioned whether Wu Di really was as personally involved in government as has traditionally been assumed, and if this is the case, then it suggests that the rise of the inner court may be more due to other factors, such as clever palace attendants and the like, manipulating the emperor to act in certain ways, or other trends that we simply can't detect. As we've seen with economic policy, the government became more interventionist under Wu Di. The most dramatic manifestation of this in the legal and social sphere was the employment of a number of men whom Sima Chen dubs the harsh officials. Now, we have to be careful because the chapter on harsh officials is another sneaky way that Sima Chen criticised Wu Di. The chapter is juxtaposed with a collection of biographies of reasonable officials, all of whom lived in the pre-imperial era, which seems like it was intended to make Wu Di's harsh officials look that much worse. It's not clear whether Wu Di went out of his way to employ men who had a reputation for severity. Nevertheless, it's enough of a trend that historians have felt comfortable talking about the harsh officials as a feature of Wu Di's reign. The men whom Sima places under this category form a bit of an amorphous group. Some were honest, dutifully doing their job and strictly following the law, while others were corrupt, bending the law to suit their own purposes. The common thing tying them together was their severe application of the law and their ruthless punishments. Their philosophy of government was like the Machiavellian dictum, if you can't be both, it's better to be feared than loved. They were basically the inheritors of the legalist spirit, or at least the inheritors of the worst aspects of the hand stereotype of the legalist spirit. Sima Chen paints a familiar narrative, 
in his introduction to his chapter on the harsh officials. We are told of the failings of Chin's overly legalistic approach, creating a situation where, quote, only the hardiest and cruelest of the officials were able to bear the strain of office and derive any satisfaction from the task. Those who cared for justice and virtue were left to rot in insignificant posts. Then, when the hand came to power, they softened things out. Quote, the law officials were honest and simple-hearted and did not indulge in evil, and the common people were orderly and content. So we see that good government depends upon virtue, not harshness. However, as the dynasty matured, so-called harsh officials began to appear, a callback to the Qin style of government. During the reign of Empress Liu, there had been one named Ho Feng, who persecuted members of the Liu clan. Under Jing Di, there was Chao Tsua, who we've talked about extensively, and Zhe Du and Ning Cheng, who achieved notoriety during their tenure as, respectively, governor and commandant of the commandery Ji Nan. There, they repressed a wealthy clan, known for its, quote, power and lawlessness, by executing several of its members and thus giving it a healthy dose of fear. Wu Di's reign saw a large rise in the number of harsh officials. Of the 15 men who are biographed in the harsh officials chapter in the records, and the equivalent chapter in the Book of Hand, 10 had their careers during the reign of Wu Di. Even so, the 10 individuals would seem like a fairly insignificant number if we consider the vast size of the Han bureaucracy. However, Seema mentions a number of times that the methods of these harsh officials were imitated by many others hoping to advance their career. So, maybe we can say with some caution that they were characteristic of the era. I'm only going to talk about one of these harsh officials in detail, Zhang Tang, who left some important legal legacies and was in charge of trying some of the more important scandals of Wu Di's reign. But before doing that, I'd like to relay a few select episodes from the careers of some of the other harsh officials, so as to paint a picture of what sort of governance style we're looking at here. The main characteristic of the harsh officials was their brutal application of the law. They were fond of mass executions as a way of intimidating their subjects into behaving properly. Yi Zong received a posting as governor of Ding Xian Commandery, and when he arrived there, he made a surprise visit to a jail. He seized 200 of the prisoners and a similar number of their friends or family who had illegally snuck in to visit them. He accused the visitors of plotting to free the prisoners, and all 200 prisoners and their guests, about 400 people in total, were executed in a single day. Seema adds to his account an emotional touch, saying that after the execution, quote, though the season was warm enough, the entire province shivered and trembled. Another horror story is that of Wang Wenshu's time as governor of Hainei. There, he arrested a large number of powerful mobsters and bandits, and had them quickly tried and investigated. About a thousand families were implicated as a result, and he executed a lot of them, so that, quote, blood flowed for miles around. Something that was apparently especially shocking to the people of Hanei was the speed with which he received imperial approval for the executions. He had set up a relay system of privately owned horses so that he could send messengers quickly to Chang'an. Executions were not meant to be performed in spring, and apparently when the spring of Wang's first year in Hanei began, he, quote, stamped his foot and sighed, Ah, if only I could make the winter blast one more month, I could finish my work to satisfaction. Here we can maybe derive that Wu Di was actively looking to promote Wang's style of dealing with criminals, for after the emperor heard of Wang's remarks, Wang was promoted to Metropolitan Superintendent. But the joy that Wang Wenshu apparently derived from his grisly work was not standard. Despite their brutality, the harsh officials were not all bloodthirsty psychos. Some governed with the ethos of stern but fair. Yi Zong, the man who later executed 200 prisoners and their guests, won admiration for his impartial governance during his time as magistrate of Changling, Gaozu's funerary town, and as magistrate of Chang'an. According to Seema, quote, he applied the laws with honesty and directness, and made no exception even for the emperor's in-laws. As magistrate, Yi Zong arrested and tried the emperor's niece's son, a man named Zhong. If you remember, in the episodes on Qin, we talked about how family ethics and legal impartiality often conflicted when it came to punishing members of a royal family. It always took a bit of courage for an administrator to punish someone who was connected to the imperial family, lest that administrator end up with some powerful enemies. Luckily for Yi Zong, Wu Di took the trial of Zhong as a sign of Yi's ability, 
and promoted Yi to commander of Henei. Another of the harsh officials famous for his diligence towards the job, and severe but fair approach, was Jian Xuan. Sima Chen describes his approach as left Metropolitan Superintendent. Quote, He attended to every detail in the area under his jurisdiction, down to the very grain and salt consumed. All matters, great and small, passed through his hands. He even doled out the supplies to the various district officers in person, in order to prevent the district magistrates and their aides from drawing and handling supplies in any way they wished. He maintained order by applying the law with the utmost severity, and during his several years in office, every affair in the province, down to the most trifling, was perfectly arranged. However, only a man like Jian Swan could have personally attended to every matter, from the smallest to the largest, in this way. It would be difficult to expect such behaviour from all officials. The impartiality of Ye Zong and the dutifulness of Juan Xuan were not par for the course, though. Some of the cruel officials perverted the law to serve their own ends. Du Zhuo, who had a stint as superintendent of trials, toadied to the emperor by delivering the verdicts that he thought Weidi wanted. He would look for any excuse to charge those whom the emperor wanted punished, and postponed punishments, and scowled for any legal loopholes to free those whom the emperor wanted freed. One time, someone accused him of failing to uphold the standards of justice. Quote, You are supposed to be the dispenser of justice for the Son of Heaven, and yet you pay no attention to the statute books, but simply decide cases in any way that will accord with the wishes of the ruler. Do you really think this is the way a law official should be? To this, Dujour had an interesting response, and honestly, one that's kind of hard to argue against, given the nature of the Chinese system, where the emperor was the ultimate legal authority. Quote, And where, may I ask, did the statute books come from in the first place? Whatever the earlier rulers thought was right, they wrote down in the books and made into laws, and whatever the later rulers thought was right, they added as new clauses and stipulations. Anything that suits the present age is right. Why bother with the laws of former times? But not every harsh official could use this twisted argument, because sometimes their toadying wasn't even towards the emperor. Wang Wenshu was Metropolitan Superintendent for a bit, and used a carrot-and-stick approach to ingratiate himself with the powerful crime families of the capital region. The carrot was to ignore their wrongdoings, the stick was to ruthlessly persecute and punish small-time criminals, a show of power to intimidate his new friends. Thus, he was brutal towards petty criminals and friendly with the larger ones. Wang Wenshu, in his time as governor of Henei, and in an earlier post as commandant of Guangping, developed a strategy to fight mobster families, which involved being a bit flexible with the law. He would investigate able men, who were members of these crime families, and dig up enough evidence to convict them. He then enlisted them to help him ferret out their fellow criminals, with the promise that they themselves would not be charged. So long as they obeyed him, he would forgive them of their crimes, even if they were quite major. But if they betrayed him, he would charge and execute them along with their families. Though Seema Chen seems to have found this and other techniques of the harsh officials to be morally repugnant, he does admit their efficacy. He says of a few of the officials that after they had implemented their policies in a particular jurisdiction, the people of that province became, quote, too frightened to even pick up objects that had been dropped in the road, a stock phrase indicating a lack of criminal behaviour. He concludes his chapter on the harsh officials with a begrudging tribute of respect to his subjects. Quote, These men, by their schemes and strategies, their teaching and leadership, worked to prevent evil and block the path of crime. All were men of strong character, combining in themselves both military and civil ability. And although they were known for their cruelty and harshness, it was a reputation that went well with their duties. But he goes on to mention some others who followed their examples, whom we are not told much about. And he leaves us with the possibly overblown impression that the average governance style in this period was not so much the severe but effective autocracy of the biographed harsh officials, but more the cruel and depraved tyranny approach. Quote, That when it comes to men like Feng Dang, the governor of Shu, who violently oppressed the people, Li Zhen of Guanghan, who tore people limb from limb for his own pleasure, Mi Pu of Dong province, who sawed people's heads off, Luo Bi of Tian Shui, who bludgeoned people into making confessions, Chu Guang of Heidong, who executed people indiscriminately, Wu Ji of the capital, and Yin Zhuo of Feng Yi, who ruled like vipers and hawks, or Yan Feng of Shui Heng, who beat people to death unless they bribed him for their release. Why bother to describe all of them? 
Why bother to describe all of them? Again, this may be seen as trying to paint us an overly dour view of Wudi's reign. Remember, this was a man who had himself been persecuted for fairly arbitrary reasons. But at the least, it sounds like there were some of Wudi's officials whom you would have been very unlucky to have as your local warden. So, that's a general group portrait of the harsh officials. Now we'll get into detail on the most important of them, Zhang Tang. Like Sang Hong Yang doing complicated maths as a boy, Zhang Tang apparently showed a talent for his particular field from a young age. On one occasion, when he had been at home minding the house while his father was at work, a rat stole a piece of meat. When his father found out, he gave Zhang a beating. Zhang then set out to arrest and prosecute the rat that had got him in trouble. He found the rat's nest, caught it, and took the leftovers of the meat as evidence. He then beat the rat to elicit its testimony, made a written record of the testimony, and compared it with the evidence. Finding the case against the animal convincing, he convicted the rat and executed it. Zhang first got an official job working as clerk in the office of the Metropolitan Superintendent of Chang'an. He was very good at networking and keeping the right people happy, and quickly rose to prominence. He became friendly with the Tian family, which was connected to Empress Dowager Wang, when he saved Tian Sheng from prison. Later, when Sheng's old brother Fen became Chancellor, he appointed Zhang Tang as his secretary. Zhang's rise was not only due to nepotism, though. Before working for Tian Fen, he had been promoted to Commandant of Morling, the county in the capital area where work for the Emperor's tomb was being done. He was recommended by the Metropolitan Superintendent for his, quote, honesty and impartiality, showing that he was not only a man with connections, but one of ability as well. After some time working with Tian Fen, Zhang was reassigned to assist the Imperial Councillor, Han Anguo. Han was more of a military man than a statesman, and was mostly concerned with the war against the Xiongnu. He was the man behind the attempt to trap the Shan Yu at Ma Yi. Zhang Tang thus came to do most of the work of the Imperial Councillor himself, despite being an assistant. During his time in this office, he was responsible for prosecuting one of the various scandals of the Imperial family that plagued Wu Di's reign. While Wu Di was heir apparent, when he was a child, he had been married to his cousin, whose surname was Chen. This was done as part of the intrigue which had put him in the position of heir apparent in the first place. Chen's mother, who was also Wu Di's aunt, elder Princess Piao, had been instrumental in getting Jing Di to give up his original choice of heir in favour of Wu Di, and subsequently arranged for Wu Di to marry her daughter. When Wu Di became emperor, he named Chen his official empress, though it was not so much out of affection for her, but out of loyalty to his aunt and mother, who had made those arrangements when he was a child. At first, Empress Chen thought her position was secure, but it soon dawned on her that it really wasn't. Wu Di preferred his other concubines, especially Wei Zifu, Moreover, Empress Chen didn't produce any children. If Wu Di had to choose a son by one of his other consorts to be his heir, then Chen would be demoted and the heir's mother would be made empress. She became very angry and hateful towards Wei Zifu, and started looking for fixes so that she would give birth to a son. She paid exorbitant amounts of money to doctors, and eventually resorted to some sort of witchcraft. However, nothing worked. She remained childless. In 130 BC, her attempts at sorcery came to light, and it was a big scandal. This is what Zhang Tang was in charge of investigating, and he rooted out all the people who were connected to the incident. Empress Chen was deposed and relocated to a palace outside the capital, and 300 others were executed. Wu Di was much impressed with how Zhang had handled the case, and made him a palace counsellor. Zhang and another of the harsh officials, a close friend of his named Xiao Yu, started drawing up new, sterner laws. The laws were designed to crack down on crime and make the bureaucracy more effective. One made it such that failing to report a crime became an offence, and another made it so that the entire staff of any particular government bureau could be held responsible for the crimes of a member of that bureau. Previously, there had been safeguards which clearly defined responsibilities of inferiors and superiors, so that an inferior would not be blamed for the failings of a superior, and vice versa. Zhang was eventually promoted to the office of Superintendent of Trials, kind of like the Supreme Judge. The way in which he carried out his job was fairly interesting. He wanted to stay on the Emperor's good side, and did so in a number of clever ways. Because of the rise of Confucianism and Wu Di's fondness for literature, Zhang thought it would be prudent to make classical references in his legal decisions. 
he employed erudites of the Book of Documents and the Spring and Autumn Annals to work as his secretaries to help him refer to historical precedents from those texts. He also let Wudi play a fairly active role in deciding cases. Of course, the emperor always had a final authority of any legal decision in the empire, but whether an emperor actually took advantage of that authority depended a bit on the personality of the individual on the throne. Zhang made sure that Wu Di felt he could involve himself in the process. He would go out of his way to consult with the emperor on complex cases and explain his reasoning. He would make notes of Wu Di's personal feelings on particular issues and promulgate these notes around his office so that his subordinates could refer to them for future decisions. If there was a case where he felt that Wu Di wanted the accused to get off lightly, he would assign his more liberally minded secretaries to it. And if there was one where Wu Di wanted a heavy punishment, he would give it to his harshest secretaries. And although in the early days of his official career, Zhang had made friends with some wealthy merchants in Chang'an, a fact which he concealed when he reached higher office because of the stigma around merchants, he apparently had a bias in favour of the poor, and would do what he could to give them lenient sentences. On the other hand, when it came to the rich and powerful, he would, quote, twist the law in an effort to find them guilty. Alongside these efforts to ingratiate himself with the emperor and the Confucian intellectual wave, he also acted the generous and hospitable member of high society. Thus, despite being an at times severe, not impartial judge, he was quite admired. It was during his time as superintendent of trials that Zhang Tang dealt with perhaps the most serious case of dissidence in Wu Di's reign. This was the rebellion of the kings of Huainan and Hangshan, or rather, the charge that these kings were plotting to rebel. The two ruled large neighbouring kingdoms in the south of China. There is quite a lengthy chapter in the records detailing their plots, but to be honest, it isn't worth recounting in detail. It's enough to give the basics behind their motives and the outcome. Liu An, the king of Huainan, and Liu Tsi, the king of Hangshan, were both disgruntled with the imperial government on the account that their father, Liu Chang, King Li of Huainan, had been demoted by Wen Di because of various crimes, and had died while being transported to his exile. In addition, Liu An developed a sort of delusion that he himself could become emperor. Early into Wu Di's reign, in 139, when the emperor was still young and childless, the supreme commander, Tian Fen, had rather carelessly remarked to Liu An that if the emperor should die without an heir, then An would be the best choice to succeed him. Delighted by the prospect, Liu An began to delude himself about the state of the empire, and over the years came to think that outside his own kingdom, China was suffering under brutal tyranny. He believed that if he revolted, it would be easy to get the common people on his side, and that he would be hailed as a revolutionary in the same vein as Chen She, who had begun the rebellion against Qin. He patronised men of learning and artists like Wu Di was doing, in order to build a reputation for himself as a wise king. As a product of this effort, we have a work called the Huainan Zi, which is an encyclopedic, eclectic sort of work, drawing from various philosophies, especially Taoism, which provides a guide for how a ruler should conduct himself. The king of Hengshan, Liu Tsi, was apparently not very friendly with his brother An, but had his own grievances against the Imperium. As well as the memory of his father's punishment, he was dissatisfied with the ministers of his kingdom, who were more loyal to the emperor than to him which was, if you remember, by design. One of Jing Di's responses to the rebellion of the Seven Kingdoms was to give the central government the right to appoint all the major government officers of the kingdoms. Moreover, he was worried that if Huainan revolted, it would invade his own kingdom, Heng Shan. Thus, he made plans to mobilise in case that happened, which would have been illegal. Even if it was in self-defence, kings were not allowed to call out their own armies without imperial permission. Either way, the king of Huainan's plan to revolt came to light when his ostracised younger son revealed them to the government in 123 BC. Zhang Tang, as superintendent of trials, was sent to investigate. The investigation also revealed the intentions of the king of Hengshan. The two were executed in 122, along with several tens of thousands of their associates. Also implicated in the investigations was the king of Jiangdu, Jiangdu was another large kingdom neighbouring Huainan, on the southeastern coast. It was ruled by Liu Jian, a nephew of Wu Di's. Similarly to Liu Tsi of Hengshan, Liu Jian had heard about Liu An's intention to revolt, and had started illegal military preparations in case he needed to defend his kingdom. In the course of the investigation, some other crimes of Liu Jian came to light, mainly sexual improprieties. During the mourning period following the death of his father, 
he had had intercourse with one of his father's concubines. He had also committed incest with all of his sisters. Wudi probably did not want to execute Liu Jian. As a sign of lenience, he had Liu Jian tried in Jiangdu, rather than forcing Jian to come to Chang'an for cross-examination. Nevertheless, Jian committed suicide in 121. The kingdoms of Huainan, Hengshan, and Jiangdu were all abolished, and their territories placed under imperial control. Aside from the bloody punishment decreed by Zhang Tang and the massive amount of territory that was newly put under imperial control, you could say that the revolts of the kings of Huainan, Hengshan, and Jiangdu were significant for their insignificance. There is no sense that the plots of these kings ever posed a real danger to the central government. Unlike at the start of the dynasty, where the feudal lords were powerful political actors in their own right, the Imperium could now confidently and easily handle disloyal kings. And what's more, because the kings had been so disempowered, many of them now realised loyalty was their best option to hold on to what they had. As part of the investigation of the revolt, a council of several of the other kings was held, and they unanimously condemned the actions of Liu An. During Wu Di's long reign, aside from Huainan, Hengshan, and Jiang Du, there were only three other instances of kings being deposed by the central government, and these were for minor crimes, that is, minor compared to plotting revolt. In 138, the king of Jichuan was exiled for killing some of his centrally appointed ministers. In 127, the king of Yan committed suicide after his crimes of incest came to light. And in 116, the king of Jidong was exiled because he was a murderous psycho who went on marauding expeditions in his own territory and killed random people. Anyway, the handling of the case was a big boost for Zhang Tang's career. Shortly afterwards, he was promoted to the post of imperial counsellor, the second highest office in the land. In fact, at this time the men who served as chancellor were largely ineffectual, so Zhang was basically the most important person in government, besides the emperor himself. In his role as imperial counsellor, he had a hand in the experiments with minting new currency, which preceded the Wushu coin of 119. More notoriously, he developed a law which allowed the government to confiscate the property of those trying to evade the newly introduced property taxes, and was bent on ruining many powerful merchants and landlords. Around this time, he also invented a new category of crime called disapproval at heart, when he perceived that the superintendent of agriculture, Yan Yi, was critical of some recently created law, but had not voiced his concerns. Yan Yi was a personal enemy of Zhang's, and it happened to be the case that, according to Zhang, Yan's offence was deserving of death. And indeed, the unfortunate Yan Yi was executed. Although Zhang was at the peak of his career, he was not without his detractors. He made an enemy of Di Shan, a court scholar, who proposed that a peace alliance be concluded with the Xiongnu, out of concern for the depletion of China's resources. Zhang dismissed Di as, quote, a stupid Confucianist. Di then retorted, questioning Zhang's loyalty by pointing to his brutal response to the plot of the King of Huainan, accusing Zhang of driving a wedge between the Emperor and the members of the Liu clan, the other feudal lords. In general, Zhang's harsh approach to government made him a lot of enemies, until, according to Sima Chan, quote, eventually everyone, from the highest officials down to the common people, was pointing an accusing finger at Zhang Tang. However, Wu Di himself remained a steadfast ally for Zhang, even going so far as to visit Zhang in person when he was sick. He defended Zhang from the accusations of Di Shan, and sent the unfortunate Di to take command of a guard post on the border, where Di was later killed during a Xiongnu raid. But the Emperor's friendship could not protect Zhang forever. Zhang had several powerful enemies. The Chancellor, Zhuang Qingdi, who feared that Zhang had his mind set on becoming Chancellor himself, put three of his chief secretaries to work digging up dirt on Zhang. All of these secretaries also had their own personal grudges against Zhang. And unfortunately for Zhang, there was a fair bit of dirt to find. He had maintained relationships with some of his merchant friends, and was using his insider knowledge of what ordinances were in the works to help them make good investment choices. It asked buying or selling according to whether a certain good would increase or decrease in value after the new law was introduced. Perhaps more scandalously, there was a case where one of Zhang's subordinates, Lu Yeju, had fallen sick, and Zhang had showed an unseemly amount of deference towards him. He had gone to visit Lu in person, and even went so far as to massage Lu's legs, a very humiliating thing for a superior to do for an inferior. The superintendent of trials, Jian Suan, also disliked Zhang Tang, and when, in 116, he submitted the report to the emperor, Wu Di could not ignore it. 
Zhang tried to deny the charges of corruption, but the evidence against him was incontrovertible. Wu Di wanted to give Zhang the chance to commit suicide rather than suffer the disgrace of being sent to jail, an opportunity which Zhang took up at the behest of his old friend, Xiao Yu, the one who had helped him in the early stages of his career. Zhang's mother was so ashamed of his conduct that she refused to give him a lavish funeral and carried him to the graveyard in an ox cart, with only an inner coffin to encase him. Wu Di, on the other hand, Although he knew that he could not have kept Zhang in the job after the evidence of his corruption came to light, we're still sorry to see him go. To avenge Zhang, he brought charges against Zhuang Qingdi and his secretaries, who had orchestrated Zhang's downfall. Zhuang Qingdi committed suicide. Also, Wu Di promoted one of Zhang's sons to high office as a way of compensation. Zhang Tang's name was behind some of the laws which defined Wu Di's reign disapproval at heart, confiscation of property, and whole bureau responsibility. However, it's questionable whether all of these new laws were really such good ideas. The story behind the development of disapproval at heart seems to suggest that it was intended as a negative incentive to prod ministers into being more open with their criticism of policy. In his condemnation of Yan Yi, Zhang Tang said, quote, Yan Yi, one of the nine highest ministers, having seen that the law was impractical, did not state his opinion to the emperor, but nevertheless disapproved of it in his heart. It seems that the main problem, according to Zhang, was not that Yan was critical of the new law, but that he had withheld his criticism. However, as we might expect, the law had the opposite of the intended effect. It made ministers fearful of expressing their qualms about the emperor's ideas at all, and instead they sought to flatter him and stay in his good graces. I think it's possible that this played a part in the shift of the power from the official bureaucracy to the inner court. The status of holding an official government position no longer guaranteed a man enough safety to criticise and develop ideas for new policy. What you needed was the personal friendship of the emperor, like Zhang himself enjoyed. Another case of where Zhang's ideas may have backfired was with the principle of extending responsibility. Sometime after Zhang's death, a new law known as the Concealment Law was developed stating, quote, If bandits arise and their presence is not reported, or if the full number are not arrested after the presence has been reported, everyone responsible, from the 2,000 pickle officials down to the lowest clerks, will be executed. It'd be unfair to saddle Zhang Tang with responsibility for this ludicrous piece of legislation, which demanded an absurdly high standard of competence from the officials. However, it does seem to be inspired by his laws that made it illegal to fail to report criminal activity, and that held whole bureaus responsible for the offences of individuals. The concealment law, ironically, caused provincial officials to try and conceal criminal activity rather than prevent it. It was much easier and safer to try and cover up banditry and ignore it than to acknowledge it and risk being sentenced to death for failing to arrest all the culprits. Having talked about the shift from the outer court to the inner court, the harsh officials and some of the new laws of the dynasty, There are two other governance sort of things I'd like to mention. The first of these was the purge of what I call the old guard marquises in 112. When it came to creating new marquisates, there were two general classes of people whom Wu Di liked to reward. There were the sons and other relatives of feudal kings whom he enfeoffed as part of his strategy to weaken the kingdoms, and there were those who received them in recognition of their merit, especially for military achievement, or for foreigners who joined the Han. However, there was a whole bunch of Marquises that had inherited their positions from their ancestors. Gaozu especially had created a lot of Marquises, and their fiefdoms had been passed down for several generations to Wu Di's own time. When Gaozu had created them, Marquisates had been a useful way of governing as much land as possible before there was a mature bureaucracy that would allow the imperial government to rule everywhere directly. But by this point in the dynasty, that bureaucracy had developed, and Marquisates were no longer a necessary unit for administration. Thus, in 112, 106 Marquisates who had inherited their fiefdoms were demoted, ostensibly for failing to offer the correct portion of rich alcohol in their annual tribute to the Emperor. But it's possible that Wu Di was also angry at them for not following Bu Shi's example in volunteering to fight in the Nanyue campaign, which was launched that same year. The other thing I wanted to mention was the establishment of regional inspectors in 106, the regional inspectors were responsible for checking in in the governance of their commanderies. The different commanderies were grouped into 13 clusters, known as provinces, with one inspector for each province. 
One of the interesting things is that though the inspectors were responsible for monitoring the commanderies, they were actually ranked lower than the commandery governors. The office was probably created because of the huge increase in the number of commanderies. By 106, their number had doubled since the start of Wudi's reign. With so many of them, it would have been difficult for the central government to keep monitoring them directly. The last broad topic I'd like to talk about regarding Wu Di is the various dramas involving the imperial family throughout his reign, and his eventual choice of heir. An unusual thing about Wu Di's concubines was that nearly all of them were commoners. Aside from his first empress, Chen, whom he was married to for political reasons, none of the named women whom he took as wives came from noble families. Worse, some of the women came from families of singers and dancers, not at all respectable occupations. Historian Jun Shu Zhang speculates whether this elevation of commoner women was inspired by his mother. Empress Dowager Wang was herself originally a commoner, and it's possible that by choosing commoner women as his consorts, Wu Di was trying to do away with the sort of stigma that his mother had been subject to during the early years of her marriage to Jing Di. Now, as we discussed, Wu Di's first empress was Chen, who was deposed in 130 after a black magic scandal. It was not until a few years later, in 128, that another of Wu Di's concubines was selected to be empress. The lucky woman was Wei Zifu. She had been brought to the palace by Princess Pingyang, Wu Di's sister. Princess Pingyang was married to the Marquise of Pingyang, and in 139, early into Wu Di's reign, she presented to the emperor a number of girls from her husband's marquisate, because Wu Di had not yet fathered a son, and the empire was without an heir apparent. Wei Zifu was not one of the selected girls, who were all from good families. She had been brought along with a number of others to perform as singers during the occasion. It ended up that Wu Di found none of the selected girls interesting, but Wei Zifu caught his attention, and that night they shared a moment de more, and Wei entered the palace harem. However, Wei's first year at the palace was not a fun one. Due to the efforts of Empress Chen to keep Wei and her kin in obscurity, Wu Di ended up ignoring Wei completely. Eventually, as part of a workforce imbalance correction in the palace, a number of the palace ladies were to be sent home. Wei, quite bored, languishing as just some lady-in-waiting and not receiving any attention, managed to attain an audience with Wu Di, and begged to be sent home as well. Instead, Wu Di took pity on her and began to favour her again. She stayed in the palace and rose to become one of his favourites. She bore him four children, three daughters and a son. It wasn't just Wei herself who benefited from the emperor's favour, Several of her relatives were elevated alongside her, some of whom we've already met. There was Wei Qing and Hua Chubing, generals who were in charge of some of the largest campaigns against the Xiongnu. They were respectively the brother and nephew of Wei Zifu. Her brother-in-law, Gong Sun He, was another commander in the Xiongnu campaigns, and later served as chancellor between 103 and 92 BC. In all, five members of the Wei family received marquisates, and in 122, the ultimate honour was bestowed. Wei Zifu's son, Liu Zhu, was named heir apparent. This was done partly in reaction to the investigation of the king of Huainan, who had been fueled by the belief that, so long as no heir apparent had been named, he had a chance at becoming emperor. Wei Zifu remained empress for 37 years after her nomination, and her family enjoyed considerable political power. However, she herself did not remain Wu Di's favourite for that whole time. As she grew older, his attention turned to other women. There was Lady Wang, who gave birth to a son who became King of Qi, but she died young, and few of her relatives achieved positions of note. She was the concubine whose ghost Wu Di tried to communicate with under the guidance of the magician Xiao Wang. After Lady Wang, the next woman to receive the cream of Wu Di's affection was Lady Li. This was another short-lived romance. Though we do not know the exact year she began service at the palace, we know that she died young. Despite the brevity of her time in the spotlight, though, a number of men from her family were able to rise to prominence. Her brother, Li Guangli, became a general and led the famous campaigns to Da Yuan. 
another of her brothers, Li Yanyan, was already a eunuch serving in the palace before his sister joined Wu Di's harem. After she did so, he too became romantically involved with Wu Di, and received numerous honours, including a new office called Master of Harmonies, which was in charge of musical entertainment at the palace. He also received seals, which marked him as equal in rank to the nine ministers. In the winter of 92-91 BC, some events happened that snowballed into a major dynastic crisis. Gongsun Jingsheng, son of the Chancellor Gongsun He, and nephew of Empress Wei, was arrested for embezzling a huge sum of money meant for military use. Gongsun He offered to catch a man named Zhu Anxi, a criminal who was loose in the capital, in return for having his son released of his charges. The emperor agreed, and Gongsun did in fact catch Zhu. In prison, Zhu, as an act of revenge, wrote a letter to Wu Di, which accused Gongsun Jingsheng of having an affair with one of Wu Di's daughters by Empress Wei, Princess Yang Shi, as well as, of, as well as accusing him of performing various black magic spells to bring harm on the emperor. At the time of the incident, Wu Di was in his late 60s and was becoming increasingly worried about dying. He hurriedly investigated both Gongsun Jingsheng and his father, Hei, and they were arrested and imprisoned, where they died in the spring of 91. Gongsun He was replaced as Chancellor by Liu Chu Li, a man who was connected to Lady Li's family. His son was married to Li Guang Li's daughter. It was not the first time that Wu Di had acted on suspicion that witchcraft was taking place. Of course, there was the case of Empress Chen. There were also previous instances where he had organised large-scale investigations to try and ferret out evil magicians. One such search immediately preceded the Zhuanxi Gongsun affair, where police scowled the Shanglin Park for any malignant presences, and the gates of Chang'an were closed for 11 days. It was an ominous warning for the capital about the emperor's momentary mental instability. The downfall of Gongsun He showed that Wu Di's suspicion of witchcraft could be used as a tool to bring down political rivals. According to the Book of Han, he was, at this moment, quote, spontaneously inclined to imagine evil, and suspected the whole of his immediate entourage of working with Gu, the Chinese version of a witch's cauldron, imprecations and spells. Tragically, shortly after the Gongsun case, two of Wu Di's daughters by Empress Wei, Princesses Yang Shi and Zhu Yi, were accused of witchcraft and were executed. Unfortunately, I've been unable to find any detailed account of the story behind this occurrence, and I do not know to what extent their cases were linked to that of Gong Sun He and Jing Sheng. Yang Shi was the princess whom Zhan An Shi had accused Gong Sun Jing Sheng of having an affair with. In the summer of 91, Wu Di fell sick and retired to the Gantron Palace northwest of Chang'an. A man named Jiang Chong took advantage of the Empress' paranoia and blamed his sudden illness on sorcery. Jiang Chong was the superintendent of waterways and parks, the head of that new ministry in charge of the mints at the Shanglin Park. He and the heir apparent, Liu Zhu, were on bad terms, and Jiang was worried that if Wu Di died and Liu Zhu came to the throne, then he himself might face some charges or even death. Jiang investigated the residences of the crown prince and other notables and found evidence that various acts of black magic had been performed. Liu Zhu was startled. His father was away, sick in Ganchuan and may have already passed away without them knowing. His tutor, Shi De, a member of the Wei clique, reminded Liu Zhu of the disaster that had befallen the Qin prince Fu Su, who had been tricked into giving up his position as heir apparent and committing suicide by Zhao Gao and Li Si after the first emperor had died. Liu determined that he must take action before something similar happened to him. He arrested and beheaded Jiang Chong, and killed Han Yue, the superintendent of the imperial clan, who questioned the prince's authority to make the arrest. At the same time, Liu sent a messenger to his mother, Empress Wei, to mobilise the guards of the Wei Yang and Changle palaces. Though he had moved quickly, it was not decisive. A colleague of Jiang Chong's, Zhang Gan, managed to escape the prince's men, and fled to Ganchuan, where he informed the emperor of what had happened. Also, mobilising the guards was not an entirely smart idea. It doesn't seem like Liu Zhu had the authority to do so, and the population of the city was apparently unhappy about it. The chancellor who had replaced Gong Sun He, Liu Chu Li, at first went into hiding and sent a messenger to the emperor asking what to do. When Wu Di found out what had happened, he was outraged, interpreting the actions of his son as a revolt. He sent back an order to Liu Chu Li, reading, quote, 
For the catching and beheading of rebels, there are, of course, rewards as well as punishments. Build armoured turrets on ox carts, and do not engage hand to hand with swords, lest many soldiers be killed or wounded. Shut fast the city gates, lest any rebels escape. Wu Di relocated to the Jianjiang Palace in Shanglin Park, so that he'd be closer to the action. He started raising the soldiers from throughout the greater metropolitan area to come and reinforce Liu Chu Li's men in the city. Meanwhile, his son and empress, stuck within the walls, mobilised what forces they could by forging imperial credentials. Despite Wu Di's calls for restraint in the course of putting down the rebellion, by all accounts it was a massacre. The explosion and horror of the violence is encapsulated by a short paragraph by Ban Gu from the Book of Han. Quote, the prince led on his troops and drove on the people of the four wards by many tens of thousands. At Changle, at the Western Barrier Gate, they met with the army of the minister Liu Chu Li. The hand-to-hand -hand struggle lasted five days, tens of thousands were slain, and the blood flowed down into the moats. But as the ministers steadily received reinforcements, the crown prince was defeated. Liu Zhu managed to escape the city through the Fuang Gate, south of the Changle Palace. The officer in charge of the gate, Tian Ren, led him through at nightfall, an act of kindness that he'd soon pay the price for. Liu Zhu fled east, where he sought refuge with a friend. However, he was later discovered and killed, along with his wives and children. Only one of his grandsons was left alive. Meanwhile, Empress Wei never attempted to escape the capital, and had already committed suicide. Many others were punished in relation to the incident, including families of those who had already been killed. Tian Ren was sentenced to death by bisection. The imperial counsellor, Bao Shengzhi, was also sentenced because he had declined to punish Tian Ren for letting the prince go. He committed suicide. The year 91 ended with Empress Wei's faction emaciated. The empress herself and her children were dead. Her brother-in-law, Gong Sun Hei, and his family were dead. Even men who were fairly tangentially connected to the Wei's ended up being accused of witchcraft. Gong Sun Ao and Xiao Ponu were commanders who had served under Wei Qing and Huo Chu Bing, brother and nephews of Empress Wei. Wei Qing and Huo Chu Bing had died before the Black Magic Incident, and Gong Sun Ao and Xiao Ponu were both living in obscurity after failures on the battlefield. Nevertheless, their wives were accused of witchcraft and were executed too. The fact that most of the prominent victims of the witch trials were members of the Wei clique has led to speculation about whether the accusations of black magic were really just a cover for a political dispute. Historian Michael Lowe says that it was an attempt by those related to Consort Lee to oust the ways from power. However, I'm not sure what the basis for his reasoning is, as the only people involved in the witch trials at this stage, who was firmly part of the Lee family clique, was the Chancellor, Liu Chu Li, and he seems to have been mostly a reactionary rather than a proactive actor in the crisis. I don't know of any links connecting Jiang Chong and the others who first investigated the prince with the Li family. Historian Liang Tsai says that if there was some Machiavellian schema behind the whole thing, it could have only been Wu Di himself. However, she points to difficulties in establishing a motivation for the emperor to do such a thing. The only clues we have from the standard histories is that Empress Wei had fallen out of favour and that another son of Wu Di's, Liu Fu Ling by the consort Zhao, had apparently had a miraculous birth an unusually long gestation period, which suggested that he should be made heir apparent instead of Liu Zhu. Perhaps then, the whole thing was an elaborate and bloody plot on Wu Di's behalf to rid himself of an empress he no longer loved, and to open up the position of crown prince so he could nominate his new favourite son as the heir. But this explanation does not seem consistent with what happened next. For one thing, it was a few years before Wu Di chose a new heir to replace Liu Zhu, which cast doubts on the idea that the whole thing was engineered so that he could select a new successor. Furthermore, the witch trials were far from over, and with all the ways nearly eliminated, new targets found themselves under suspicion. The Lee family and its allies stood to benefit the most from the removal of the Wei family. Now, Lady Lee herself had probably already died of natural causes before the whole black magic terror started. The clique was instead centred around the son she had born Wu Di, Liu Bo, who had, made, who had been made King of Chang Yi. Men of the Li clique stepped in to take up the vacant roles left by the persecution. Liu Chu Li, connected to the Li's by his son's marriage to Li Guangli's daughter, had become Chancellor after the death of Gong Sun Hei. 
One of Liu Chu Li's subordinates, Shang Chiu Cheng, became imperial counsellor after Bao Sheng Ji's suicide. Li Guang Li, Lady Li's brother, was already the preeminent general of the empire since his victory over Da Yuan in 101. But before the Li family could really establish themselves, they too fell victim to the sorcery paranoia. In the spring of 90 BC, Li Guang Li and Shang Chiu Cheng, along with another general, were sent on a campaign against the Xiongnu. Before leaving, Li Guang Li spoke to Liu Chu Li about the matter of a new crown prince, seeing as Wu Di had not yet nominated another of his sons since the death of Liu Zhu. He said, quoting from the book, I hope, my lord, that you will as soon as possible persuade the emperor to appoint the prince of Changyi to the dignity of heir apparent. Should he become our emperor, would you, my lord, regret it? Naturally, both Li Guang Li and Liu Chu Li thought that they would benefit if Lady Li's son were to ascend the throne. However, when Liu Chu Li submitted the idea of nominating Liu Bo as heir apparent to Wu Di's secretaries, the fairly reasonable suggestion got distorted into something much worse. Liu Chu Li and his wife were accused of performing acts of witchcraft in order to kill Wu Di. In addition, they and Li Guang Li were accused of performing other spells so that Liu Bo would become emperor. Liu Chu Li, his family, and those of Li Guang Li's family who had remained in Chang'an were executed. When Li Guang Li, out campaigning, heard the news, he decided that it would be best not to return to China and surrendered to and joined the Xiongnu. The other brothers of Lady Li, Yan Yan and Ji, were both executed as well. A few years later, in 88 BC, Liu Bo himself died, perhaps suspiciously. I mean, I can't find out why he died, but he would have been quite young. That same year, the imperial counsellor and Liu Chu Li's former subordinate, Shang Chiu Cheng, committed suicide after more witchcraft allegations. After the execution of Liu Chu Li and Li Guang Li surrendered to the Xiongnu, the two most powerful consort families, the Weis and the Lees, were politically decimated. Yet even now, the trials didn't stop. Attention turned to those who had been opposed to the late heir, Liu Zhu. Some of those associated with the original conspiracy against Liu Zhu were executed. Other men who had played a role in his eventual capture and death, several of whom had been rewarded with noble titles because of their deeds, were also disposed of. The most reasonable explanation for why the tide turned against these men is that Wu Di simply realised that his son had been the victim of a conspiracy and that his revolt had been an attempt to defend himself, not an attack on the Imperium. I am of the opinion that the witch trials were more the result of Wu Di's paranoia, a reaction to perceived enemies, and probably fueled by a genuine belief on Wu Di's behalf that dark arts are being used against him. The progression of the different groups of victims, first the Weis, then the Lees, then the enemies of Liu Zhu, looks more like a random lashing out than a masterminded scheme to use black magic as a cover for juggling harem families. That's not to say that everyone who was accused was innocent. After all, a culture where belief in the efficacy of black magic was fairly common meant that not only were there people who were afraid of it being used against them, but there were also people who thought that they could use it against others. Throughout the account of the trials in the Book of Han, there are lots of investigators producing evidence that some sort of sorcery had been attempted, and I doubt that all of it was forged. The years of the witch trials would have been uncomfortable at the least for the residents of Chang'an. Hopefully something would happen soon enough that would ease the fear of being accused of practicing black magic, and maybe even of being a victim of it. The man who replaced Liu Chu Li as Chancellor, Tian Chan Shu, had pleaded with the Emperor to take it easy on executing so many people. Quoting from the book, Wishing to cure the Emperor of his mania and thus bring rest and consolation to the people, he and his co-ministers, who drew a salary of 2,000 stones of rice, presented to him a wish for his long life, with an eulogy of his virtues and excellence, and advice to show benevolence and out of compassion to remit the punishments. However, the Emperor didn't heed the call to lenience. Part of his reply reads thus, Quote, I am without virtue, since the Chancellor on the left, Liu Chu Li, and Er Shi, Li Guang Li, led a rebellion. The plague of witchcraft has spread to officials. For months I have managed to swallow only one meal a day. I constantly feel sorrow for those officials, and I want to forgive their past misdeeds. Nevertheless, when the use of witchcraft was first uncovered, I ordered the Chancellor and the Grand Secretary, Imperial Counselor, to supervise the officials to sniff out and arrest witches, 
and I ordered the commandant of justice to prosecute. But I never hear back from these officials. Even today, there are still shamans who have escaped and have not yet been arrested. The yin disaster invaded my body, and those close and far all produced goo, which is cauldrons or poison. I am so ashamed of this. How could I possibly achieve long life? The trials continued, affecting not just the political groups I've already mentioned, but others as well. It's possible that they kept on going, right up until Wudi's death. Perhaps, thankfully then, the answer to Wudi's question, how could I possibly achieve long life, was that he couldn't. In the spring of 87 BC, he fell sick and retired to Ganshuan again. It became apparent that this was not an illness that he would recover from. Yet, even in his final days, on his deathbed, Wudi left us another interesting thing to talk about. Because if I've written this well enough that you've been able to keep track, then you should remember that Wudi still hadn't nominated a successor. In the second month, while Wudi was on his deathbed, it, would, it was announced that Liu Fuling, at the time less than 10 years old, would succeed the emperor. It's not at all apparent why Fuling was chosen. Wudi still had two other sons alive, both of whom were adults. There was Liu Su, the king of Guangling, and Liu Dan, king of Yan. Both were sons of a consort named Li Yi, whom we know very little about. The former, Liu Su, was a bit of a ruffian, apparently fond of fighting wild animals barehanded. Perhaps he was not really emperor material. But Liu Dan, on the other hand, seems to have been fairly competent in his role as King of Yan, and was probably the obvious choice of heir. When he heard of Liu Zhu's death, Dan sent a letter to the emperor requesting permission to come to the capital in expectation of being nominated heir apparent. However, the simple letter was met with anger by Wu Di, who refused to name an heir until he lay dying. Liu Fuling's mother, Zhao Jie Yu, had already passed away by this time, and there's even some question of whether she was murdered by Wu Di, perhaps to prevent Liu Fuling's emperorship from being hijacked by a potentially domineering empress dowager and her clan, though there's no proof to back up the idea. To help the young boy in ruling the empire then, a handful of men were elevated to take responsibility for the tasks of government. One of them was our old friend Sang Hong Yang. After a dip in his career, being demoted from his post as superintendent of agriculture to commandant in chief of the granaries in 96 BC, he was launched right back up, being made imperial councillor, the second highest post in the land. He would play an influential role in the government of the next emperor. There was also a trio of men who were appointed as sort of regents to Liu Fu Ling. These were all men who had spent most of their careers in the inner court. There was Huo Guang, who received the titles Marshal of State and General-in-Chief, and was made Director of the Secretariat. Jin Midi, a surrendered Xiong Nu, who was made General of Chariots and Cavalry, and Shang Wanjie, who was made General of the Left. Of these, Huo Guang was the most important, and as Chief Regent for the Young Boy and Director of the Secretariat, he was soon to become de facto the most powerful man in China. As such, we'll go into a bit of backstory. Huo Guang's rise came out of nowhere. He was in fact tangentially connected to the Wei family. His father, Huo Zhongru, had had an affair with Wei Zifu's sister, Wei Xiaowe, the product of which was the famous General Huo Chubing. Huo Guang himself had been born to a different mother, and given that he had survived the purge of the Wei clique, he probably didn't associate with them much. Huo Guang had gotten work at the palace on the recommendation of his brother, Huo Chubing. However, for 20 years he languished as a palace attendant, while others in similar positions progressed in their careers. In fact, he had virtually no achievement next to his name before he was given this huge responsibility as chief regent. And this raised questions about whether he really had been given this huge responsibility, or if in reality he had taken it. In his final moments, none of Wudi's sons had apparently attended his bedside, and the high ministers preferred not to intrude on the inner chamber where their monarch lay dying. Perhaps this had created an opportunity for, pa for a palace attendant like Huo to make some adjustments to the emperor's will before transmitting it to those awaiting the news. This was certainly alleged at the time. Another palace attendant, Wang Hu, claimed that he had been by the emperor's side the entire time, and that Wu Di himself never drew up the edict promoting Huo Guang and the others, and he explicitly accused Huo of forging it. Liu Dan, the king of Yan, who had hoped to become the next emperor, even went so far as to say that Liu Fuling was not, in fact, Wu Di's son, but rather Huo Guang's. 
I'm inclined to believe that some shenanigans did take place. There doesn't seem to be a reason why Wu Di would have voluntarily entrusted Huo and the others with such an important job, and it seems like Huo would have had the opportunity to meddle. Whether they got their jobs legitimately or not, the new regents would find themselves the subjects of a lot of suspicion and would have to overcome several hurdles to try and keep their positions. That, though, is a story for next time. Wu Di died on the day Ding Mao of the second month of the second year of Huo Yan the 29th of March, 87 BC, two days after his successor was chosen. Considering that so far I've written more than 60,000 words on his reign, hopefully I've conveyed the idea that Han China in 87 BC was a very different entity to what it had been 53 years before when he'd assumed the throne. Of course, there's everything we talked about last episode, gaining the upper hand on the Xiongnu, the greatly increased contact with other peoples, and the massive expansion of the empire. Then there's the stuff from today's episode. To name just a few things, there was the establishment of Confucianism as state ideology, the cultural confidence and flourishing marked by the performance of the Feng and Shan sacrifices and the changing of the calendar and colours of the dynasty, the switch to a more interventionist government style, seen in the administrative spheres with things like the harsh officials, and in the economic sphere with the Sultanai monopolies and other modernist projects and the beginnings of the transition to the inner court rather than the bureaucracy being the locus of government. Even things I only touched on briefly, like the further reduction of the kingdoms, would have been key topics if we were discussing the reign of a lesser emperor. With all this said though, it's hard to know what exactly Wu Di's role in all of this was. Was he actively pushing these changes, or did he merely lend his name to the era while other men sat in the driver's seat? I've mentioned it before, but the nature of the way the standard histories were written makes it a bit hard to answer this question. They rarely talk directly about what the emperors did, and when they do mention an imperial edict or something, it's usually unclear who exactly had the idea for it. We usually have to rely on the few anecdotes of an emperor's personal life to get a glimpse of their personality, or make inferences based on other things. Some historians have described Wu Di as personally vigorous and active, René Grosset says, quote, Gifted with prodigious energy and an extraordinary vitality, he took no thought of conserving his strength. One finds him, like the Assyrian kings of former times, bringing wild beasts to bay in high grasses, reckless of his life and the great consternation he caused his attendants. A man of remarkable intelligence, full of bold and original ideas and with a taste for autocracy, he nevertheless understood the wisdom of listening to the opinions of others. Jun Shu Zhang sees Wu Di as personally invested in many of his policies, especially the war against the Xiongnu. He makes a lot out of Wu Di's edict, which described the campaigns against the Xiongnu as a vengeance for historical grievances, Gaozu's loss at Pingcheng and Mao Dun's insulting letter to Empress Liu. For Zhang, Wu Di's ambition for military conquest was kind of the driving force behind several other changes. The promotion of Dong Zhongshu's Confucianism was an ideological justification, and the new administrative and economic policies mobilised men and resources for the campaigns. However, others have questioned the extent to which Wu Di himself can be credited with the achievements of his reign. Michael Lowe writes, quote, Many writers have ascribed to him personal qualities of vigour and initiative, and held these to be responsible for the achievements of the reign, but on closer inspection, Direct evidence to support such claims is far from clear-cut. Much of the initiative which was taken in these decades may be traced to the proposals of his statesmen, some of whom were related to the emperor's consorts, but Woody himself took no personal part in the direction of the military campaigns for which his reign is famous. We read of him taking the leading role in religious ceremonies, supervising the final moments of repairs to the dikes of the Yellow River, or inspecting a victory parade. In addition, he is reported as seeking means to achieve immortality or listening to the persuasive talk of magicians and intermediaries. When troubles broke out between his consorts and their families, the witchcraft trials, the 60-year-old emperor apparently could not quell the disturbances by force of character. Don't take them too seriously, but I'll say some of my own thoughts on the matter. I can't fully dispense with the idea of Wu Di being an energetic man. In a system like Han China, where the emperor was the ultimate arbiter, I don't think you could have the drastic policy changes of his reign without some involvement from the man himself. If I may, I'll crudely apply Plato's chariot analogy to the question. 
In Plato's chariot, you've got two horses in a charioteer. One horse is a noble steed, passionate and powerful, embodying higher moral impulses. The other horse is wild and untamed, representing man's base instincts. The charioteer represents the intellect, the force which steers the two energies. I think of Wudi as being like the two horses. Sometimes he pulled towards good ends, like defeating the Xiongnu and expanding Chinese dominion. Here I mean good purely from the imperial perspective. Or even sponsoring the arts. But sometimes his drive was towards bad ends, like punishing critics, harsh laws and witchcraft trials, products of his vindictiveness and paranoia. Then the men around him, the ministers and influential attendants, were the charioteers. They utilised Wudi's energy, sometimes crafting policies to the benefit of the empire, like Sang Hong Yang's economic innovations, or all the men who planned the military campaigns, and sometimes to fulfil their own desires, like Dong Zhongshu's elevation of Confucianism, and even more nefarious things, like exploiting the terror of the witch trials to deal with political enemies. Did I just say Dong's elevation of Confucianism was his own desire, not a goal of Wudi's? Well, yeah. Here's the part where I try and pull some of my disparate narrative threads back together. So, I described the rise of Confucian ideology as perhaps the most important event of Wudi's reign, but I really wonder if that's what he had his mind on when he approved Dong Zhongshu's famous proposal. That phase where there were several influential Confucians and Confucian sympathisers, like Tian Fen, Du Ying, Dong Zhongshu, and Gong Sun He, happened fairly early in Wudi's reign, when he was still a young man. He was perhaps quite impressionable, and I think what he was probably most interested in about Dong's philosophy was the justification it gave for military expansion. He may not have thought too hard about what it meant to restrict the erudite's focus to the classical texts. My reason for thinking that he wasn't too committed to Confucianism as a state ideology is all the evidence from later in his reign. There's the work of Liang Tsai, showing that Confucian scholars made up a very small minority of men who reached senior ministerial positions. There's the employment of harsh officials, whose philosophy of overwhelming punishment was not at all in line with the Confucian ideal of ruling by virtue. There's the implementation of modernist economic policies, which we'll see next episode came under severe criticism by the more Confucian-minded reformists. His ignoring the advice of classists when it came to religious practices like the ritual of the Feng and Shan and the building of the Bright Hall. Even with his literary taste, his love of Seamus Yang Ru's fantastical works of poetry did not agree with Confucian orthodoxy. All these things suggest to me that ultimately, he didn't take Dong Zhongshu's great unification of thought very seriously. Even if the establishment of Confucianism as the state ideology was the greatest legacy of his reign, I'm not sure that it was by Wudi's own design. But again, please don't take these musings of mine very seriously. Of course, the other contender for greatest legacy of Wudi's reign was his conquests and territorial acquisitions. Amateur historian Sunny Y. Aoyang says of Wudi, quote, Were he a Western emperor, he would be called the Great. But traditional Chinese commentators had more mixed feelings about him and his conquests. Of course, military accomplishment could be a valuable political badge, but it could also be a bit of a double-edged sword. In the Roman Empire, campaign experience was practically a prerequisite before entering the higher echelons of politics. In China, while military achievement could be a pathway into politics, it was not the default one. Most high ministers either came from important distinguished families, or worked their way up through the vast civil bureaucracy. Perhaps because they were not a military class, Chinese intellectuals were always wary of the costs of expeditionary wars, and less impressed by the gains. Whether it was from the Confucian ideal of attracting barbarians by cultivating virtue, or even military idealism, exemplified by the famous line from The Art of War, quote, the skillful leader subdues the enemy's troops without fighting. The Chinese political class was simply less enamoured with victory in battle. The fact that a direct fight had taken place at all meant that the situation was less than optimal. We've already seen how Sima Chen subtly criticised Wu Di in the records, even Ban Gu, who is generally more positive about the Han Emperors, deals Wu Di a bit of a backhanded compliment by somewhat wistfully pondering what might have been if the Emperor's energies had been more focused on the welfare of his people than on conquest and extravagance. Quote, if Emperor Wu, with his superior ability and his great plans, had not departed from the modesty and economy of Emperors Wen and Jing, and if, by means of these principles, 
he had helped the common people. In what respects could any of those heroes who are praised in the Book of Odes or the Book of History have surpassed him? Even before this passage, where Bangu celebrates Weirdi's achievements, the focus is all on what the Emperor did to elevate Confucianism, and there is no mention of his conquests. Wudi was in fact one of his own worst critics when it came to his campaigns. Following an unsuccessful campaign against the Xiongnu in 90 BC, the one where Li Guangli surrendered after hearing about the extermination of his family back in Chang'an, Wudi issued a famous edict, wherein he rejected a proposal from Sang Hongyang to expand a military agricultural colony in the western regions near a city called Luntai, otherwise known as Begur. In the edict, he called a halt to military expansion so that the people could have time to rest and work on farming instead. Unfortunately, the translation of this edict into English is difficult to access, and I've read conflicting reports on how much personal responsibility Woody actually took for the negative consequences of his previous campaigns. According to amateur historian Sunny Waiya Yang, he, quote, blamed others for the defeat of 90 BC. But according to an article from a Falun Gong website, written by Sing Sheng, Weidi, quote, criticised himself in public and apologised to the whole nation for his past military policy mistakes. What I do have is a translation of Bangu's preamble to the edict, which might give us a bit of a taste of it, and also gives us an example of Ban being more explicitly critical of Weidi's campaigns. Quote, The strength of the people was spent and resources were exhausted, and there followed up some years of poor harvests. Robbers and thieves rose up everywhere, and the roads were impassable. For the first time, commissioners appointed directly by the emperor were sent out, clothed in embroidered silk and bearing axes, to exterminate the bandits and commanderies in the kingdoms, and only then was the danger overcome. For these reasons, in his latter days, Wu Di abandoned the lands of Luntai, and proclaimed a degree expressing anguish and sorrow. Nevertheless, don't go away from this episode thinking that Wu Di's territorial gains were begrudged or that he was reviled in the same way the first emperor was. Even Sima Chen cited the expansion as an accomplishment in his introductory paragraph to his incomplete chapter on Wu Di, saying, quote, When the fifth ruler came to the throne and began his reign in the era Jian Yuan, the Han dynasty reached the height of its glory. He drove back the barbarian tribes beyond the borders, and within the country, put the laws and regulations in order. When it came to worshipping deceased emperors, the former hand would maintain temples and cults for their previous four emperors. Once a new emperor came to the throne, the temple of the most distant emperor would be disbanded. The only exception was for Gaudi, whose temple was permanently maintained. But towards the end of Western Han, about a century after his death, it was decided that Wu Di too should be permanently worshipped in recognition for his enduring legacy. There's something I'd like to mention in preparation for the upcoming episodes. As you might have guessed, considering that this was the episode where we talked about Sima Chen's life, his records of the Grand Historian doesn't contain any information about subsequent emperors. This means that I'm going to start using Bangu's Book of Han as my primary source, and that means that I'll be quoting a lot more from the older translation by Homer H. Dubbs, rather than Bernard Watson's translation of the records. Dobbs's translation is fine, and in fact remains the standard English translation of the Book of Han. However, some of the terminology he uses is a bit inconsistent with what I've been using so far, and when I quote him, I'm going to change some of the words he uses to more modern equivalents. The most important change has to do with the Xiongnu. Dobbs translates the word Xiongnu as Huns, because there was a theory that this particular group of nomads, who were such a presence in Han Dynasty China, later migrated west and were the ancestors of the Huns who invaded the Roman Empire of the 4th and 5th centuries AD. I'm going to use the word Xiongnu in place of Huns when I quote him, 
mostly for consistency and to avoid confusion, but also because there's no definitive proof that the two groups were related. The other change I'm going to make has to do with the titles of ministers in the Han government. There are several systems for translating these titles. I've been trying to stick to the Low system, which is used in the Cambridge History of China. It prioritises conveying the role of the office over a literal translation. There wasn't really an established system around when Dobbs was translating the Book of Han, and though the terms he used were organised by later scholars, there aren't really any guiding principles behind his translation. There's been a decent amount of scholarly debate over the most appropriate way to translate these titles, and I'm in no position to declare that one system is better than another. However, again, simply for the sake of consistency and to avoid confusion, in most cases I'm going to use low equivalents when quoting Dubs. So, for example, Dubs' translation of the titles for the Three Excellencies are Lieutenant Chancellor, Grandee Secretary, and Grand Commandant which I will amend using Lowe's translations, Chancellor, Imperial Counselor, and Supreme Commander, respectively. There's a very useful Wikipedia page, Translation of Han Dynasty Titles, which has a table with the Chinese terms, Lowe's and Dobbs' translations, and other systems, which I've found very handy, and it's worth checking out if you're interested in this sort of thing. And uh, going into the new year, I've got a talk a bit about what are my plans for the podcast. So this episode marks the last of the scripts which I wrote in between May and October 2018, the the time between the release of the first Chin episodes and then uh and then the release of um the episode on Liu Bang versus Xiang Yu. So um in the time since that episode came out I've written I've written the first drafts for some of the episodes that will come after this, but uh, in a way, kind of, the anime is catching up to the manga, so to speak. So this means uh, the rate of production will slow down a bit. I've been keeping a two-week schedule, which I should be able to keep for at least a few more episodes. But, um, yeah, there'll be a kind of decrease in the rate of production generally. And there's a few other reasons for this. Um, so this podcast is just something I do as a hobby. I don't do it as a job. I don't make any money from it. Um, next year also, or this, this year rather, 2019, I'm going back to uni. So I'm going to have less time available to me. And, uh. The thing with writing these scripts is that even though, uh, like, they do take a lot of research to kind of, my my writing process for them is quite research intensive. And I'm not saying that as in, like, uh, it's, you know, very accurate, but saying that as in it takes a lot of time to write. You know, I can't just kind of knock out a thousand words a day, something like that. Um, and some of the episodes will probably be a bit shorter than, uh, what you might've been getting used to, which is a result of these, not so much a result of the time constraints, but, uh, because, um, because of the, a bit of a change in the nature of the sources that I'm working with. So the, the translation of the book of Han is basically not completely done into English. Dubs's translation only has the 12 chapters covering the emperors, and uh, a lot of the kind of detail from the, from the biographies of officials and generals and stuff is just not available to me. So I won't be able to go into the same sort of detail. Uh, the focus might shift a bit because I'll be relying more on secondary sources so maybe I can talk more about questions of historiography or take a broader view of the events. I'm aware you might uh, you you might criticize my um, what I've written so far is kind of big man history, which is kind of a side effect uh, of me focusing so much on the records of the grand historian. Um, 
yeah, so so there might be a bit of a change uh, to the feel of the episodes in a way. I'm not sure how. Uh, well, I guess I guess we'll see going ahead how much that's kind of detectable. But um, yeah. So the the upload rate might be a bit less frequent, but look, my goal is to reach the end of the Eastern Hand, and uh, so I'd be very grateful if you stayed subscribed, or to or if you subscribe if you haven't already. I am kind of uh. I don't know what the word for it is, but, you know, seeing that uh, my podcast is, or that my work is interesting to people is quite motivating for me. Um, so, you know, that will definitely keep keep me on the ball, so to speak, if, I, if I'm feeling that people are listening. Um, and speaking of that kind of stuff, I would like to do at some point in the future, a sort of questions and answers episode. So if you'd be interested in such a thing, you know, you can send an email or contact me on the website. And, uh, if there's enough interest or enough people asking questions, um, I can, I'll sort of announce that at the end of an episode and, and, uh, and it'd probably just be something that I attach to the end of something or, I don't know. But on that note, you can email me at offspin-history at tutornota.com or send me a we- message on my website offspinhistory.wordpress.com And as always, I'd like to thank Professor Shui Shan Yu of Northeastern University for letting me use his music from the album The Vibrant Rhythm of Ancient Heroes.